Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and what you've seen right here is the world's first video of what's known as a time crystal. Now it's a complex topic, but we're going to dissect exactly what it means, and this video will hopefully help you understand the significance of this discovery and this particular study that's found in the description below. First of all, what exactly is a time crystal? Well, it's a crystal in time, but okay, that definitely doesn't explain anything. Let's start with crystals. You might already know what crystals are, but just in case you didn't, it's essentially different types of materials that form very specific geometric shapes based on the underlying structure. Such as this crystal right here, known as galena, or the more famous example right here, known as quartz. And the formation of these geometric structures is essentially related to the underlying atomic structure of the material in question as it solidifies and forms this solid structure. And so, for example, let's just say we wanted to take a look at the molecules of the Galena crystals. The structure here would look something like this. And as the structure grows and becomes larger and larger, the octahedral geometry starts forming these relatively large cube-like formations and sometimes octahedrons, formed because all of the molecules on the inside have exactly the same structure as well. Quartz, on the other hand, has a different molecular structure and thus results in a more hexagonal shape. And that's essentially how all of these crystals grow in a nutshell. As something solidifies and as the molecular structure stays constant, they grow into these large shapes, turning into large geometric objects, like this really cool halite crystal that's around 16 centimeters in diameter. And on the inside, it kind of looks like this. And if you want to check out more of these images and also find out more about the crystals, you can find the link in the description. And so a lot of things out there become crystals. Things like water becomes ice crystal. We also have sand that becomes a crystal. Even your DNA and even sugar and salt become crystals. And we of course also have something known as liquid crystals that are often used in LCDs. So today crystals are used in a lot of different ways and we kind of depend on them both technologically and in terms of just regular life. Although, interestingly, by definition, to create a crystal, the symmetry has to end at some point. So without ending the symmetry, you don't really have the crystal. But anyway, semantics aside, let's get to the topic at hand. Roughly around 9 years ago, back in uh, 2012, the very famous physicist, who you might have already heard about from a previous video, Frank Wilczek, who also won a Nobel Prize in Physics, made a theoretical proposition that, hypothetically speaking, we should also be able to have what's known as a time crystal. So a material that's not just symmetric in space, but is also symmetric in time, both in space and in time. It's a space-time crystal. And his proposition made a lot of sense, but nobody really knew how to approach it. Although within just a few years, in 2016, the first time crystal was discovered, although it involved some really crazy particles and a lot of spinning ions, and it wasn't really what you would call a um, symmetrical material in space. It was a time crystal, though. But this time around, the actual creation was a lot different and way, way more impressive. As a matter of fact, let's actually just watch this video one more time. Because what you're looking at here is literally the first ever video of an actual space-time crystal. It's a material that's both symmetric in space and in time. And you can kind of see it coming back in time to the exactly the same structure after a certain period. And that's something that we've actually never seen before, and something that was never created anywhere in the world. Which means that it took about 9 years to go from a physical hypothesis to literally creating this in a lab. And that's quite impressive. And to create this, the scientists had to use an extremely tiny micrometer-sized perma alloy, which is basically a mixture of nickel and iron, and then blast this with a tremendous amount of microwave radiation. And this resulted in the creation of what they refer to as magnons. Magnons are basically kind of like pseudoparticles or quasi-particles that often arise when something interacts with something else. A more real-life example here would be like something like this. It's a flock of birds that forms a shape. But this is a quasi-shape or a quasi-particle in this case. It's formed by individual birds, but the actual shape itself doesn't really exist. And this is an example of what magnon would be in physics. And what we're actually observing here is a kind of a recurring periodic magnetic structure inside the crystal that then remagnetizes once in a while. And that's because iron nickel material is quite magnetic, but they were changing the amount of magnetism by blasting this with microwave radiation. 
And so in this case, what we're looking at is essentially a recurring structure. It's a structure that sort of moves around a lot and then comes back to the original position after a specific time, thus creating the space-time crystal. But just like with a lot of similar ideas, kind of like Einstein back in the 1920s, Wilczek also predicted this to be very hypothetical and probably not really real. He didn't think it existed in nature or could be created. Einstein, likewise, also did not believe black holes were real. But now we know that both seem to exist and both are possible. And that's actually the mind-blowing part. It's the idea that someone had in their mind that was later created in a lab. And what makes this even more groundbreaking is the fact that this is at room temperature. These are not exotic components, these are not elements that are like near absolute zero. This is just regular metal stuff at regular room temperature. Which is actually really exciting because one day we'll definitely find a way to use this somewhere in the lab in some way or another. And one of the implications from the study already is that we could potentially use this in quantum computing. Because time crystals obviously allow us to predict what's going to happen in a specific period of time, we can use them to predict quantum effects. And a lot of quantum interaction by using qubits, for example, is actually easily achieved through the use of these magnons. Obviously, this is not a concept I'm going to be able to explain in this video, but you can also maybe check out some of the previous quantum computing videos I made that do actually go into this in some more detail. There should be some videos popping up above me. And because by nature these quasi-particles can interact with other particles and vice versa, it means that we can actually create systems using time crystals where things are controlled and where things are predicted very easily in both space and in time. Obviously, we already know how to use normal crystals, the space crystals. For example, your phone right now might be based on LCD, liquid crystal technology. But this right here creates a completely new field of study and also a potentially a completely new field of various products we might have in, I guess, three or four decades from now. Something that nobody right now can even imagine. And because this pattern was clearly appearing and disappearing on its own, without any changes in the microwave radiation, it only suggested that all of this was most likely quantum in nature. It probably related to the quantum spin or some other quantum element present inside of the molecules of this material. Now, how exactly this works is not entirely clear yet, but the scientists think that because of the microwave radiation bombarding this piece of metal, some sort of an oscillating magnetic field was produced inside the material, which then interacted with the quantum effects from the electrons inside iron and nickel, and thus produced this very unusual quasi-particle wave that was crystallized in both time and in space. And so here I guess it's important to kind of note that it's not really a physical time crystal. It's not really made out of real molecules. Here it's made out of a quasi-particle and in this case of something related to quantum effects inside the atoms. And the other thing to note here is of course the camera that had to be used for this experiment. Apparently it's an extremely complex x-ray camera that was made specifically for the experiment. As you can see here it actually allows us to see every single wavefront even though these are extremely tiny in size, only nanometers in size, and it shows us absolutely everything with relatively high resolution, about 20 times better than any light microscope can produce. And all of this was also filmed at around 40 billion frame rates per second, roughly around a billion times more than the video you're watching right now. So it's definitely a really cool discovery and a super cool experiment. But what exactly we're going to be using these crystals for, only time will tell. Unlike a typical crystal like this quartz crystal here, we still don't really have any physical use for them, but the potential for radio communication and for maybe even radar or some sort of imaging technology is definitely already there. We can also possibly use these time crystals as a way to keep track of memory in quantum computers, essentially quantum memory. And on the other hand, they can also be used to have particles interact across very, very large distances. So definitely a lot of potential applications. But once we actually understand what to do with them, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a pretty unusual and a pretty interesting discovery of a potential third type of subatomic particles. Although in this case, it's not a true subatomic particle, it's what the scientists refer to as a quasi-particle. It's a particle that sort of becomes only visible and only apparent in the presence of other, more simple subatomic particles. Now, this concept is actually pretty complicated, but it's been theorized for many decades now, and it's known as anion. 
And it looks like finally, after years and years of speculation, these scientists have been physically proved that they can exist and they do form a kind of a third realm of particles that now have to be investigated in a lot of detail. And although by itself this whole concept is actually extremely complicated, I'm gonna try to explain it in relatively simple terms and also give you a practical reason for why this is actually important. The reason being quantum internet and quantum computing, something that a lot of different countries and a lot of different universities are currently actively trying to develop. So first of all, let's start with something a little bit more simple with the basics. What you're looking at right here is a representation of a proton. That same proton that's responsible for creating various atoms in the universe. And what's interesting about this particular image is that it actually shows you the two major types of particles, subatomic particles, present in the universe. Here we have both the fermions and the bosons. Now, in a nutshell, fermions, and in this example it's the quarks that are U, U and D, up and down quarks, with the other commonly known fermions being electron and neutrino, can be summarized as the subatomic particles that need to have their own space. They're basically kind of like the introverts of the subatomic particle world. For each of the electrons, for example, you have to have them in separate locations, in separate parts of space. They cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Which is actually why a lot of matter in the universe such as, for example, the exotic matter, like the one we can find in the middle of a neutron star, starts behaving so strangely. That's because either neutrons or, in some cases, electrons start to get bunched up so close together that they actually start to produce a lot of really exotic interactions. They're essentially subatomic particles that do need to have their own space in the universe. Then we have bosons, which are these other types of subatomic particles that are, in a sense, extroverts. They can totally occupy the same space and share exactly the same point of space with other bosons. And in this image, the bosons are represented by these squiggly lines in between the quarks. This is what we refer to as gluons. The gluons, in this case, are responsible for essentially kind of connecting these quarks together. But from all of the bosons, you really just have to think about photons, the, you know, the stuff that produces light. We can technically shine exactly the same light at exactly the same spot and it's totally capable of existing in the same spot at the same time without causing any exotic interactions or without causing any serious problems to anything in the universe. Something that fermions, like electrons, cannot do. So this is basically the main difference between the fermions and the bosons. And in general, fermions and bosons pretty much explain all of the interaction we see in the universe with some minor exceptions. And for the most part, all of the visible matter in the universe falls under these two categories and a lot of the interaction of the matter can be explained using either the fermion or the boson. And for many years, scientists have actually thought that maybe this is basically it, at least for our universe, for our three-dimensional world. But several physicists, specifically several theoretical physicists, did not really agree with this because they also realized that if you were to reduce one of the dimensions, in other words, if you were to turn three dimensions into two dimensions, you suddenly have a lot of these other unusual subatomic particles coming into existence and acting in very different ways. And one of the main proponents of this, and also the first person to actually kind of even explain all of this, is this scientist right here who wrote this paper you can find in the description, Dr. Frank Wiljak, who essentially even kind of coined the term anion to explain that, you know, anything can go on in these conditions and anything can happen. It was really more of a play on words. But over the years, more and more scientists started to realize that maybe he was actually onto something. And specifically, they started to realize that by having only two dimensions, things like, for example, fermions, like electrons, would actually start acting a little bit differently and would start producing these unusual effects, at least in theory. This wasn't really practically proven and it was actually very difficult to prove as well. But the theory behind this was so solid that more and more papers started to come out in regards to this, started to explain how all of this could work, and most importantly, started to produce devices that can actually prove all of this and use these effects from these anions to possibly use them in some kind of a practical tool. And one of these practical experiments has actually been conducted by Microsoft, whose team is now convinced that this is maybe the future of quantum computing. And there's a really good reason for this. And that reason has to do with, in some sense, the definition of what anions are. So, in a sense, 
Let's try to imagine what all of this means by using some of the images from this paper you can find in the description. In a normal three-dimensional environment, I can essentially take two particles and have one of them orbit or move around the other without really having it collide with that particle. So for example, right here, these two random particles, in this case it's just golf balls, can more or less coexist with one another because of the third dimension. Even if I start trying to decrease the distance between them, they can always find a way to not really collide with one another and not to be in the same spot. And if we, for example, think of electrons, this means that these electrons can basically coexist in the same 3D location without really being in the same spot, which they're not allowed to do because they're fermions. But turns out things change completely once you remove one of the dimensions and force these electrons to do all of this in two dimensions. Which is pretty much what the scientists in this recent experiment were able to do by using this relatively complex device. When there's only two dimensions involved, at some point the two electrons are actually kind of forced to be in the same spot. Which ends up producing some really strange effects. The two electrons now start acting as this system. They basically become a kind of a joint system acquiring their own rules that are not really truly fermion rules and not truly boson rules. In other words, the system now becomes something completely different. It's neither fermion nor boson. And in this case, it even starts to meet all of the theoretical predictions and descriptions of the theory of anions. Which basically suggests that by placing electrons in a two-dimensional environment and by forcing them to do things they shouldn't be able to do, we are able to create these quasi-states, these anion states, that acquire their own properties and start acting as a kind of a quasi-particle with its own new rules and its own physical properties. And that's what makes this somewhat unusual and also extremely interesting. And from the perspective of quantum computing, what makes anions especially interesting is that they seem to actually possess what's known as memory, especially when it comes to this twisting or this spinning that you see on the screen. And the easiest way to explain why this is important, let's take a look at this example again. So right here we have these two golf balls in this certain position. Let's just imagine that these are electrons, although that's probably not the best analogy here. Now we want to recreate this state again, so in order for us to do this, we actually have to have this ball move around once and I guess somewhere around here, we are now back to the original state. So after one spin, it's back to its original position and location, where we can kind of say that nothing has changed. But when it comes to these anions, this whole spin situation is a lot more complex. As a matter of fact, for a typical anion, theoretically at least, to return back to the original situation, original condition where it started, you would have to have anywhere from 3 to 5 to maybe even more spins. In other words, this whole spinning process can be used as a kind of a memory storage for a potential quantum computer. And this is exactly why Microsoft has been so exceptionally interested in this theory and has also been trying desperately to find a way to use these unusual quasi-particles to possibly create some kind of a super quantum computer that obviously no one really has any idea how to make just yet. And this type of a property is really important for any kind of a quantum computer, mostly because retention of information and also retention of any data in quantum computing is extremely hard. Quantum particles have a tendency to just do their own thing. They pop in and out of existence, for example, they tend to have relatively low accuracy. But if you can find a way to control the actual memory of the quantum computer, and to have a system where the quantum information storage becomes more predictable, this changes the game completely. This now becomes a much more practical way of creating something that we can actually turn into, well, in some sense, another informational revolution, going from the classical computing age to the quantum computing age. And so according to this paper that you can find in the description below, this is exactly what the scientists in this paper were able to finally prove. They were finally able to show that anions indeed exist and seem to possess these properties that we kind of predicted they would have. And so in some sense they also discovered this third type of particles. But these particles are not really true particles, they are quasi-particles. They are just this new state of subatomic matter that only exists if other particles are already there. In some sense, you can think of it as, for example, a snowflake or any other complex shape. This shape by itself is formed by tiny water molecules that connect to one another in such a way that they actually form this very beautiful fractal formation. But this fractal by itself 
is a kind of a quasi shape. It's a shape that arose out of the existence of other smaller particles. And that's kind of what anions are in a nutshell as well. They're not really particles by themselves. They only really become apparent and start existing when you take electrons, place them in two dimensions, add a lot of magnetic field to this, cool them down to practically absolute zero, and then have them interact with one another. That's when these anions become apparent and are basically formed by the collective behavior, collective action of these individual electrons. But practically speaking, we're still really far from our ability to use this knowledge and to use these resources to construct an actual computer. We're still years and possibly even decades away from even the first attempt to use all of this to create some kind of a practical quantum computer that can actually use this as a source of memory. Right now, all of this is very, very theoretical and still needs so much more work and so many more studies before all of this can come together and create something functional and something practical. Nevertheless, these are definitely super interesting discoveries and one day will probably lead to something absolutely incredible that we can create as humanity. Okay, so let's see what the media is talking about today. A map reveals a cosmic void where laws of physics seem not to apply. Dark matter findings suggest Einstein may be wrong. Huh, it's gonna be one of those days again. Anyway, hello wonderful person. Just like every science communicator, at some point in life I learned that as soon as you mention Einstein was wrong, or talk about how laws of physics might be broken somewhere, it definitely captures everyone's attention. But I guess at some point you also start feeling really guilty about those headlines, and so I'm gonna try to avoid doing that in this video. But we are actually going to be discussing these particular findings because they are absolutely fascinating and, well, unfortunately do not actually prove Einstein wrong. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite, they prove him extremely correct, and they also show us that we sort of understand the universe extremely well. However, in this particular finding, there is one unusual discovery. I'll mention this near the end of the video. So what exactly are we talking about? We're talking about the Dark Energy Survey, also known as DAS for short. And this is probably one of the biggest collaborations on the planet, except for maybe some of the other ones like the Event Horizon Telescope, that involved seven different countries, 25 different institutions, and over 400 different scientists some of whom you see right here in this picture. And the purpose of this survey, along with the actual studies behind it, is to kind of establish if we understand the universe and if we understand what's happening in the universe by trying to compare the theories of the universe, and specifically the theory we usually refer to as the Lambda CDM model of cosmology, and compare and contrast this model to the actual observations from different telescopes. Now in this particular case though, they only used one major telescope located in Chile, uh, this one right here, and the telescope here is really famous because it also has this extremely powerful digital camera attached to it. A camera that they refer to as dark energy camera. And the purpose of the camera, as the name suggests, is to study the dark energy. The mysterious, I guess, substance or something that seems to cause the universe to expand faster. And because this camera has something like 570 megapixels in it, which is I think about 50 times more than the camera in my smartphone, and also because over the course of six years, from 2013 to 2019, the scientists also have been able to use this for over 750 nights in total, they were able to discover quite a lot already. Now, first of all, this is the third year, the so-called year three of Dark Energy Survey, and here after 345 nights of observations, with about one-eighth of the night skies observed, they were able to uncover close to about 230 million different galaxies, and a lot of really interesting features in between those galaxies, including things like cosmic voids, with one visible in this particular image, and with a total number of these found standing at 3222, while also confirming the idea behind the clumpiness of the universe, meaning that the galaxies are not just sort of evenly spread out, they are more or less clumped, forming what you see right here. This is what we refer to as the cosmic web while at the same time also identifying several major gravitational lensing effects, all of which was exactly what they expected to find, and all of which was also required for them to confirm Einstein's theories, confirm our cosmological models, but most importantly, prove several major things. First of all, that dark matter seems to be real. As a matter of fact, this is probably the biggest proof we have right now that dark matter seems to be, well, everywhere, at least in those regions where they looked at. Or in other words, just as predicted in the Lambda CDM models, 
at least 25% of everything in the universe seems to be the mysterious dark matter. And the way that they were able to see this is by looking at those various galaxies everywhere, and we're talking about close to about 230 million galaxies, using the redshift of these galaxies to establish the more or less precise distance to them, and then establishing the overall mass present in those regions by observing the weak lensing effect that you see right here, for example. This is one of many galactic clusters that have previously been discovered to have a lot of dark matter in them. And so in this image from Hubble, you can kind of see the lensing effect by something invisible, but something really massive in this region right here. And so by using the combination of the gravitational lensing effects, which allowed them to more or less establish the total mass of dark matter present there, and by combining this with the observations of galactic clustering or galactic clumping, and looking back on this region right here that roughly represented the universe from today up to about 7 billion years ago, while also combining this with some really, really rigorous statistical analysis, which involved a lot of sort of blind analysis where you don't actually know what you're going to find, they were able to confirm some really major assumptions we had about the universe. First of all, we have to compare this to one of the previous major releases known as the Planck Collaboration. This one was using the Planck Telescope to literally try to study the universe by looking at this, the cosmological microwave background, or the so-called oldest light in the universe. Now, this was a very important discovery a few years ago, and there was a very important confirmation of our theories, but this only represented a snapshot of the universe approximately 13.8 billion years ago. It was really important for the scientists to see if the original predictions from these Planck observations would actually be confirmed by observations from some of the later universe, the universe today, for example. So, would something similar be visible if we look at the universe 7 billion years ago, 6 billion years ago, or even closer to today, I guess. And so for this reason, a lot of unbiased, blind statistical analysis was used to try to establish some of these parameters, including, of course, the Hubble constant that we often talk about. And well, in a nutshell, 26 out of 30 papers released so far essentially suggest that pretty much everything we believed about the universe seems to be more or less correct. So, for example, if we look at the Hubble constant or the expansion of the universe, the original value from the Planck collaboration was about 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. In other words, for every 1 million parsec of distance, the universe expands by about 67 kilometers per second faster. In this collaboration, the value was a little bit higher, it was about 68.1, but still within the boundaries what the scientists expected it to be. Although do check out one of the previous videos where I actually go into some other studies that do talk about this mystery in a little bit more detail. But pretty much everything else in these studies suggests that our understanding of the universe from the previously mentioned Lambda CDM model seem to be more or less correct. The observations in this case do indeed meet the expectations from the theories. Now obviously not everything, but for the most part they are more or less correct. There is, however, one thing that they were kind of surprised about. And this is why the publications you might have seen online mentioned Einstein being wrong and so on. The only tiny difference between the observations of Planck Telescope and the more recent observations from the Dark Energy Survey seem to point at the very unusual fact that the universe seems to be a few percent less clumpy than predicted. Or if we were to look at this more practically, the original models of the formation of matter in the universe and the formation of galaxies and so on does imply that everything should be a little bit more clumpy. Galaxies should be a little bit closer to one another, the cosmic web should be a little bit thinner and so on, and everything is expected to look in a certain way. But by using the observations from the last 7 billion years, the scientists discovered that the galaxy clustering was not as dramatic as they expected. Now here we're talking about just a small percentage difference, but it is significant enough to possibly create a new mystery. Something in the universe is causing the galaxies to not be as clumpy as predicted. Now obviously it does not mean that he was wrong and nothing is really wrong with the universe. It only implies that something out there is still mysterious and is not really easy to explain with just our current understanding of the cosmological theories. Something has to be modified, we're just not entirely sure what yet. No one is sure, and so it's a mystery, and naturally nobody is really wrong yet. And considering the fact that everything else in these papers seem to actually prove our ideas and our understanding of the universe, including proving the overall density of the universe, supporting the dark energy, supporting the cosmological constant, and of course predicting the relatively similar expansion of the universe as well, 
With just that cluster in amplitude being a little bit different from what was originally predicted, overall it presents an extremely important discovery that we sort of, as humans, tend to understand the universe really well, which is really surprising. I think a lot of scientists behind these papers were probably just as surprised that our original cosmological theories from a few decades ago seem to actually predict pretty much everything, almost perfectly. And once again, these papers prove that the dark matter seems to exist, the universe or the galaxies in the universe form the beautiful cosmic web you see right here, simulated in the Illustrious project, and the galaxies tend to kind of come closer together, forming large clusters that we see everywhere, with a bunch of different cosmic voids in between them. And in this case, it was 3222 cosmic voids discovered. But I guess it's also important to remember that this is just the beginning. Remember, they only covered one eighth of the night sky. And they also started this back in 2013. After a couple of decades of doing this, we're going to have a lot of really interesting data. Possibly a lot of confirmations of theories that exist today, but possibly a lot of new mysteries that we can't even imagine yet. More importantly though, the whole purpose of this is to try to discover what's happening with this whole expansion of the universe. It's still a huge mystery, nobody really understands exactly what's happening, and there are a lot of unusual observations coming from different studies. But one of the more important confirmations coming out of this is that dark matter seems to be real after all. It seems to be everywhere. We just don't really know what it is, or what it's made out of, or how to find it. We just seem to see the effects of it. Unless, of course, this has some other explanation. Right now, there is no better explanation. But anyway, on that note, I guess first of all, congratulations to the entire team responsible for making this happen. And also, I'm actually looking forward to hearing more about the results and the discoveries coming from this incredible collaboration. At the same time, you can always check out all of this by yourself by using the links in the description. And, well, it's a lot of reading, it's actually a lot of different concepts and ideas that are extremely difficult, but these concepts are slowly taking us closer and closer to basically understanding the universe as it seems to be. Not the universe we want to believe in, not the universe that some people think exists, but actual universe as seen in the telescopes. Which of course makes this particular collaboration and these studies extremely important in helping us understand the truth of the universe. In our pursuit to try to understand how the universe works, one of the biggest discoveries to date is in realizing that a lot of the answers in regards to the mysteries of the universe actually lie inside black holes. By trying to understand what happens inside black holes and how they function, we'll finally be able to answer a lot of questions in regards to how everything else in the universe works as well. This is something that a lot of scientists realized in the last few decades. And the reason for this is really simple. A lot of modern physics depends on what's known as the standard model of particle physics. In this model, pretty much everything around us can be explained through various interactions of various subatomic particles. The particle is governed by four primary forces. But there's always been a problem with this model. It does not explain gravity or the interactions of particles using gravity. And so for many decades now, the scientists have been trying to figure out where exactly does gravity fit in the standard model. And most of the scientists, if not all of the scientists, they believe that the answers truly lie by understanding what happens inside black holes. And it looks like today we might have come a step closer to trying to figure all of this out. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a completely new and very accidental discovery of yet another property black holes seem to possess. A property that was discovered completely by accident while going through various really complex formula. And so let's talk a little bit more about all of this and what this might mean for the future of our understanding of everything around us. Starting with the idea that our understanding of black holes is really not that old just yet. As a matter of fact, up until Stephen Hawking and his original propositions that black holes have a lot of unusual properties, most people believed that these were just some unusual phenomena that might exist but might not exist at all. With one of the bigger discoveries back in 1974 being the mathematical realization that black holes most likely emit a little bit of temperature through what's known as Hawking radiation. This is the idea we've discussed in one of the many previous videos, but in short, this idea has been proven many times using analog black holes, such as the acoustic black holes or black holes relying on a lot of other principles. 
Although interestingly, the smaller the black hole, the more temperature it produces. So technically speaking, a really small black hole is actually going to be pretty hot. And so because of this, scientists started to realize that black holes do seem to possess various properties that are usually attributed to much less massive objects such as stars or planets. And this was quite surprising to many scientists, mostly because, mathematically, only three main properties should exist in black holes. They should all have mass, they should also have what's known as spin, which is essentially how fast the black hole itself is spinning, and lastly, they all have what's known as charge. But every other property, similar to a typical star such as the color, the luminosity, or even chemical composition, in this case would no longer exist. The black holes should only really have those three properties, with Stephen Hawking then adding the fourth property being the temperature. And this was actually from applying the quantum mechanics theory to the idea of black holes. The ideas from Albert Einstein do not talk about the idea of temperature at all. And so when combining the quantum mechanics with theory of relativity, this is when all of these other properties start to come out. And by combining these two theories, this is essentially how the scientists, how the physicists, are hoping one day we'll have the theory of everything, where we can actually explain the entire universe through a set of mathematical formula. And so that's basically where black holes come in and help us realize or help us study how all of this possibly works in the universe. But because today a lot of scientists are pretty certain Hawking was correct and black holes do have temperature, we can maybe start applying some of the other theories to this idea as well, and specifically ideas from the laws of thermodynamics. And although generally these laws are mostly used for things like liquids and gases, in theory they can be used for absolutely anything that seems to possess at least one of these properties, including things like temperature. And so, in the recent study that you can find in the description below, some of the scientists were essentially analyzing the idea of black holes by using some of the ideas from thermodynamics and specifically trying to figure out some of the unusual properties in regards to entropy of black holes. Although entropy by itself is sort of difficult to imagine and sort of difficult to understand, the main principle here is that, well, it's the idea behind the disorder of a system. And in black holes, this particular idea of disorder actually relates to the surface area of the event horizon. And so the two scientists from University of Sussex were essentially trying to combine the Einstein's equations with quantum theory and work out some of the problems in regards to entropy of black holes, which today in physics is done quite a lot in order to try to figure out if there's really any connection between the theories and if we can somehow find the theory of everything by combining some of the other physics into the physics of black holes. Although, quick side note, what it makes black holes so special? Well, it's actually the so-called singularity on the inside. This is the point of infinity. And today we know that when it comes to detecting infinity anywhere in physics, it usually just means that we don't really understand the concept or that our math in that point breaks down completely. We need new math or we need new theories. Which means black holes are most likely a perfect case study in order to understand what is it that we don't understand about the universe. Which of course means that the actual singularity in this case is just something misunderstood and not really yet described. The actual insides of a black hole are very likely entirely different. And so the scientists today are hoping to actually figure out what exactly happens past the event horizon. But while doing a lot of these calculations, the two scientists behind the study kept discovering some sort of an unusual feature that they really didn't understand. Something in their formula was not really adding up. Or to be more exact, something else was appearing in their formula that they didn't really understand just yet. But then a few months ago, they had a sudden revelation. They realized it seems to represent pressure. The type of pressure that usually exists in a typical thermodynamic system. And although it was a very, very small amount of pressure, it was nevertheless there. And it actually made a lot of sense. If the black hole has temperature, in terms of thermodynamics, it should definitely also have pressure as well. And here we're not talking about any kind of a gravitational pressure or anything related to gravity. In this case, it's the pressure also generated by the same principles from quantum mechanics. Although, interestingly enough, the value for this pressure was actually negative. And this suggested one thing. It suggested that over time, a typical black hole should be slowly shrinking. Something that a lot of scientists speculated about before, but something that was not proven until this particular study. And the fact that this was discovered completely by accident, and the fact that this is actually a complete surprise as well, make this particular study exceptionally interesting.
But here the question was, okay, but how much pressure? I mean, it's not a lot, but how much is not a lot? What exactly is the pressure of a typical solar mass black hole? In this case, a black hole that's essentially one solar mass, or technically would represent one of the smallest black holes out there. Well, in this particular case, the pressure is extremely low. It's 0 0.4602 bar. And okay, just for comparison, according to NASA, the surface pressure, atmospheric pressure on the moon, and that's of course something we would sometimes refer to as vacuum, is like trillions and trillions and trillions of times more. And so the actual pressure is absolutely minuscule. But just like with the temperature, this particular pressure very likely increases quite dramatically as the black holes become smaller and smaller, which also probably causes this particular black hole to shrink faster and faster as it loses its mass. But all of this is of course very theoretical for now, and technically speaking, unless we use analog black holes using, for example, acoustic waves or waves in water, we're not going to be able to actually determine any of this just yet. And also here we're also assuming that the black hole itself is not really growing and not absorbing any more mass and does not obviously have an accretion disk around itself. So in this case this would be an empty black hole completely by itself, very likely sometimes in distant future, where a lot of the black holes are basically just stuck by themselves and there's not much mass or gas going around for all of these black holes to consume. And so in this case the black hole will start emitting temperature and will also start slowly shrinking because of the pressure. And the smaller the black hole, the more emissions it will get. Which is actually kind of interesting. It means that if there's mass around, the black holes will grow in size and they'll become bigger and bigger. But if there's nothing around, they'll actually slowly start shrinking, eventually disappearing completely. But more importantly, all of these discoveries will hopefully lead us to the final question of the theory of everything, trying to connect gravity to the standard model of particle physics. At the moment, we're still not there yet, but because of these discoveries, similar to what we found in this paper, it slowly takes us closer and closer to finally finding all of these answers and finally being able to explain everything around us using a beautiful set of mathematical formula that unfortunately do not exist just yet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this relatively recent paper that makes a somewhat unusual and somewhat exciting suggestion. The suggestion that our solar system seems to be in the middle of a really really large magnetic tunnel. The tunnel that we seem to be flying through, but not really in the way that you see in the simulation here. Here we're actually going across the tunnel, mostly because it was probably produced a long time ago by a lot of different events. So let's talk a little bit more about this and also discuss the idea behind this and if it actually has any merit. But let's start right here, in the fish tank. So. As a fish, you're probably not really aware about where you live in. As a matter of fact, even if fish were somewhat intelligent, they would probably not actually be able to tell the shape of their fish tank or be able to understand what sort of an environment is around them simply because it's very very difficult to see the outside from within. Similarly, here on planet Earth and even in the solar system, it is very very difficult for us to see our surroundings. So, for example, it took us a while to figure out what the shape of our galaxy is, and it's only recently we realized our galaxy is not entirely flat. It seems to have unusual formations and somewhat unusual deformations, including unusual ripples and, of course, the folds that you see in the simulation right here. But we've discussed a lot of these discoveries in the last few years, as essentially the scientists made these discoveries. And it shouldn't really come as a surprise if we discover something entirely different and something that was always there, but we just never noticed it. Which is more or less what happened in this particular study from University of Toronto, with the scientists realizing that some of the features we've been observing in radio waves might actually be connecting in a kind of a tunnel-like formation. And it just so happens that we're sort of in the middle of this particular tunnel. Okay, so let's take baby steps. This is the Milky Way from planet Earth as it appears to us in visible light. Here's what it sort of looks like in radio light. In the last few years, specifically in the last decade, the radio astronomy sort of exploded. There is a tremendous number of various very powerful telescopes constantly scanning the skies. And a lot of new mysteries have already been discovered by a lot of these various radio telescopes. As a matter of fact, most of the modern astronomical mysteries, for the most part, usually come from radio telescopes, not really from a lot of other observations. 
And so when it comes to astronomy, we're definitely sort of in the golden age of radio astronomy. So here is the same image, but this time in radio waves. If you were to sort of start zooming in at some of these formations in more detail, you would start discovering a lot of different formations in a lot of different parts of the sky, such as, for example, the Centaurus A galaxy you see right here, or various objects in the Cygnus area. But the origin and the general formation of some other objects is still more or less mysterious. One of these objects is right here, known as the North Polar Spur. It's actually visible in a lot of different frequencies. This is from the Erosita, this is in the X-rays. And you can see that this large formation here, that's also the same North Polar Spur. It seems to be a pretty large object, and it seems to be about 500 light years away from us, but what exactly made it is not really known to us. And generally there are quite a lot of different formations whose origin is still not really known. For example, there is another region known as the Fan region that you see right here, and a lot of these errors are pointing at some of the other unusual formations, different loops and different spurs. Now, today we believe that in most cases they were probably produced by very powerful explosions. So it's quite likely that most of them probably came to be as a result of some sort of a supernova or some kind of a similar very powerful event. But the thing is, by looking at all of this from planet Earth, all of this sort of seems more or less isolated and to some extent more or less disconnected. In other words, the connection between these objects does not seem to be apparent. But this particular answer wasn't really satisfying for the scientist behind this paper, Jennifer West, who, as you can see in this picture, is definitely wearing her hard hat with a style. Somehow, she had the hunch that there was a connection between some of these objects. And so by using various computer models and by essentially trying to imagine all of this in three dimensions, her team realized that a lot of this might actually just look like this simply because of what's happening around us. It's as if all of this was tunnel only visible in radio light, with a lot of these formations simply being the result of our perspective, or essentially where we're looking at this from. And so in this case, imagine you're driving through a tunnel, and imagine all these shapes that form around you. Okay, you don't really have to imagine it, you can always look at this image. So all of these different shapes that form inside the tunnel seem to be kind of similar to what we see around us as well. The fan region right here, the north polar spur, and a lot of other formations right here, morphologically seem to represent a kind of a tunnel-like structure that we seem to be located inside. But once again, the clarification here is that we're not moving through the tunnel in this way. We're not actually flying through the tunnel. In this case, it's a lot more likely that the tunnel is actually stationary and is moving with planet Earth across the galaxy. But some of these particles are definitely following the magnetic lines across the galaxy as well. Here is another way to try to imagine what all of this looks like. If our sun is right here in the middle, you can kind of see that there are quite a lot of these loop-like formations forming an almost tunnel-like structure, which from the top also might look something like this, or something like this, with the tunnel itself, as you can see, being approximately 1000 light years in length. But even though this is referred to as the magnetic tunnel, it's not really the type of electricity and magnetism we have here on planet Earth. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even look like this. Here, the gas is really, really diffuse, and the actual magnetism is, for the most part, relatively weak. But it's still there, and forms these very, very long filamental structures that sort of represent the magnetic lines of a typical galaxy, something that we've seen before in some of the other galaxies as well. Here's, for example, a radio and optical image of a distant galaxy known as NGC 4217. And notice how we were able to capture all of these different radio filaments or magnetic lines inside the galaxy itself. So it would not really be surprising that the Milky Way has these as well. And it just so happens that we seem to be located right in the center of one of these filaments. Or I guess almost at the center. There is still some gaps here and there. And so if our eyes could somehow see the radio waves, it's quite possible that we would be seeing something that might resemble this. Well, not really as perfectly circular though. We would definitely see the arc shapes, but maybe not the full circle. And in terms of what all of this is made out of, well, it's probably ionized hydrogen. A lot of hydrogen that was probably produced by a distant supernova long time ago. Although the true origin of this is still obviously not known to us. For all we know, maybe a lot of these uh, filamental formations inside galaxies are formed in some other unusual way. But I guess what's really impressive about this particular study is the fact that since we've known about these structures since the early 60s, 
it's really, really awesome to hear that after 60 years, someone realized that there seems to be a connection between all of them. Now, obviously, this is just the first study and a preliminary study that still needs to be confirmed by other scientists, but at the moment, this looks really, really promising. So far, this paper received a lot of positive feedback, and a lot of scientists are actually kind of surprised by this discovery. More importantly, it would be really nice to see a much better representation and a much better simulation of what's actually happening here, based on modeling techniques that use a little bit more detail and have a little bit more data to work with. And doing this would be really important, mostly because a lot of this is based on mysteries we are currently trying to work out. The mysteries of the magnetic fields and various magnetic interactions inside typical galaxies. In one of the previous videos from not so long ago, we've discussed that some of these magnetic filaments have already been discovered very, very close to the center of our galaxy, but now we seem to have found some of them even closer to us. And so the origin of these filaments and also what sort of effects they have on, for example, star formation would be really important to investigate. And so hopefully in the next few years, once we have more detailed maps and more detailed modeling, we'll start getting a better picture of what exactly is happening with this magnetic tunnel that we seem to be flying through. And since we know that in a lot of stars and also around various black holes, various magnetic filaments play a really important role in delivering massive amounts of material into, for example, a star or a black hole, and because we also know that a lot of massive planets usually form in a very similar manner as well, trying to understand the exact purpose of these filaments would be pretty important in understanding the way that galaxies evolve and the way that they grow as well. But until we learn more, for now at least, we're still going to be like the fish in a fish tank. We're not really going to see the full picture just yet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the object known as Theia that approximately 4.5 billion years ago collided with planet Earth, eventually resulting in the formation of our beautiful moon. And despite this being a pretty well accepted idea today, there are still a lot of questions about this whole scenario. For example, what happened to the rest of Theia? Did it actually collide and get absorbed into Earth, or did some of it escape into some other area of our solar system? And if so, where exactly is it located today? And so in this video, we're actually going to be discussing a very interesting proposition that makes a lot of sense. Theia is indeed inside our planet Earth, and it actually explains one of the phenomena we have inside our planet that we've discovered a few years ago, but that has since been sort of mysterious and extremely difficult to explain because it does create a lot of really unusual properties on our planet. The objects known as LLSVPs, also known as Large Low Shear Velocity Provinces. But let's go back in time approximately four and a half billion years ago and start with the idea of Theia. So today a lot of scientists believe that Theia was most likely in a very similar orbit to planet Earth for at least a few million years, possibly even 100 million years. It was very likely located right here in the so-called L5 Lagrange point, which are the stable orbital points where you can place a satellite, for example, and it's going to stay there without falling into the Sun or falling back to planet Earth. And as a matter of fact, several satellites today are in those points. And in these Lagrange points, we also usually discover a lot of different Trojans, like the ones that Jupiter has, and so finding a large massive object there is not unusual. But it's still quite easy for an object in a Lagrange point to lose stability and to eventually start moving around the orbit and possibly even collide with one of the other objects. So for example for satellites, we do need to maintain their orbits to make them stable. And so approximately 4.5 billion years ago, the scientists believed that this is exactly what happened to Theia and to planet Earth. Theia itself being roughly the same size as planet Mars, and Earth being a little bit smaller than it is today, with the impact itself first creating a kind of a disk of debris, which then slowly coalesced creating the Moon. But this is a somewhat simplified picture, and you might already see a problem here. The mass and size of Theia is a lot larger than our own Moon. So where's the rest of this object? At the same time, how certain are we that this is exactly how the Moon was created? What other proof do we possibly have showing us that this so-called collision occurred approximately 4.5 billion years ago? And even though the direct evidence for this event is a little bit difficult to find, over the past few years scientists did discover a few hints suggesting that this collision did indeed occur, but more importantly that Theia chunks, those leftovers of Theia, are actually still around. And more specifically that those Theia chunks did not disappear, they did not go into the other parts of the solar system, 
they stayed on planet Earth and sunk to the bottom. And as you probably guessed by now, those chunks are what you see right here on the screen. They are indeed those LSVPs that scientists discovered a few years back. Now, in case you don't really know, these LSVPs were discovered by using this technique known as seismic tomography. And the way the technique works is by listening to different earthquake waves and the speed of propagation of those waves, and then comparing the waves, forming the overall picture of what the waves most likely pass through. By using this technique, the scientists can usually very accurately see what happens inside planet Earth and also detect various objects that would be otherwise invisible to us. And so by using seismic tomography, long ago the scientists discovered these unusual formations inside our planet. And unfortunately, even today, it's not entirely clear how they were formed. But the original explanation was that they were more likely to be possibly ancient continents that sunk to the bottom of the planet. But that proposition doesn't really explain a lot of things, especially because why is it that these continents sunk but the other ones stayed on the surface? At the same time, several studies that were analyzing volcanic rocks in Iceland identified some of the samples resembling these LSVPs and were able to measure their density, discovering that their density was about 2-3% more dense than mantle of our planet. And obviously, because this stuff is more dense, it would sink to the bottom, depositing it on top of the outer core. Interestingly, two of these blobs located beneath Africa have been implicated in the formation of these so-called South Atlantic Anomaly, which is this relatively large magnetic hole present in the region around South America, where the magnetic field becomes so weak that even satellites passing through here do have a tendency to malfunction or even become damaged. And so the scientists today think that this part right here very likely formed because of the LSVPs present in the area right here. So basically we have these very mysterious, dense objects inside our planet whose origin is somewhat difficult to explain. But what is certain about them is that they've been around for a very long time. As I mentioned previously, that study that discovered those rocks in Iceland also discovered that these uh, mantelpieces were extremely old, possibly even older than the moon itself. And if we find a piece that's older than the moon, it only suggests one thing. It most likely came from that mysterious Thea. At least that's the implication that the scientists whose paper you can find in a description make after a relatively thorough analysis. The main idea, of course, being the fact that after the moon was born, the chunks of Theia eventually stayed inside our planet and sunk to the bottom, forming these LSVPs. And the remnants of Theia are still there today. Which of course would explain why we don't see Theia orbiting somewhere in the solar system and why we don't actually have any asteroids or any meteorites landing on the planet that might have been from Theia originally. And there's quite a lot of good evidence that the scientists do provide in this paper. So for example, we know that if we were to combine the mass of LSVPs, which is about 2 to maybe 6% of mass of planet Earth, and add them to the mass of the moon, this does give us the average value for the prediction of the total mass of what Theia was probably like as well. At the same time, the predicted value for the density of Theia does actually come really, really close to the total value of density we discover inside of those LSVPs. The scientists today believe Theia was slightly denser, possibly about 2-3% to denser than planet Earth. And so the explanation presented in the paper is that, well, once you combine Theia and the early Earth, you'll get these chunks of Theia stuck inside of the mantle of planet Earth, which will eventually solidify and form the regions that do resemble LSVPs that we find on the bottom of the mantle of our planet. And because denser material usually sinks to the bottom, that's basically why the LSVPs were formed. Theia's mantle was just denser to begin with. With these pieces here representing some sort of an iron-rich and possibly highly dense mantle, slightly more iron-rich than the mantle of planet Earth. And all of this also connects to a lot of other discoveries that suggested that these really ancient LSVPs have approximately a similar age to the original impact with Theia, with all of these studies together now giving us a pretty clear picture of what probably happened about 4.5 billion years ago. So let's try to summarize. We had two objects in the same orbit, with one of the objects becoming destabilized and eventually colliding with planet Earth. With the collision itself creating quite a lot of debris orbiting around the planet, with the other parts eventually settling inside the mantle. 
The debris on the outside solidified and created our beautiful moon. But the pieces on the inside were much denser and eventually sunk to the bottom of the mantle, forming what we know today as LLSVPs. The mysterious, dense and extremely massive pieces of planet Earth that is otherwise difficult to explain. The total mass here is between 2 to 6% the mass of planet Earth. And overall, this explanation actually does solve a lot of different mysteries we've had about our own planet. But whether this is a correct explanation or whether some other explanation is going to be provided in the future, well, only time will show. For now, honestly, this is actually pretty brilliant and explains quite a lot. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this thing right here, the mysterious slash controversial EM drive. Originally proposed pretty much exactly 20 years ago by a British engineer, Roger Shore. And since then, quite a lot of different studies, including this one right here from NASA itself, try to see if the device actually works and if there's any merit behind the proposition. But as you can probably tell from the title, three recent studies have actually finally put this to rest. EM drive doesn't work. But let's take baby steps and try to summarize the last 20 years in, well, basically one video. So first of all, Roger Shore actually created a company known as SPR Limited that also patented this technology pretty much 20 years ago. You can read more about the original propositions and also learn a little bit more about SPR Limited, the company that Roger Shore created to patent this device, by following the link in the description. But just to summarize all of this, here is sort of what all of this would look like. EM drive, also known as Q-drive or RF resonant cavity, or the impossible drive, sort of works like this. At least according to the author. You would have a magnetron producing a lot of different microwave radiation that enters this cavity that sort of looks like this. It's smaller on one side, bigger on the other side. And the microwaves on the inside start to generate what's known as the standing wave, resembling something like this. Now, according to the author, according to Roger Shore, this will produce more force on one side, larger force on the other side, and in essence will then produce a push in one direction. So this type of a device is also known as microwave resonant cavity thruster. With the explanation itself being essentially that you get differential radiation pressure on two different ends. But there's a problem with that explanation. It sort of violates the fundamental physics of conservation of momentum. In other words, in simple terms, it's sort of like sitting inside your car and trying to make your car move by pushing not onto the back of the car, but literally from inside the car and pushing onto the windshield. Naturally, this would probably not work. Another really interesting analogy here is with a typical sailboat. Imagine putting a fan on the back of the sailboat and then blowing that fan onto the sail. Would that make your sailboat move? Now, I think most of us would probably say no. However, interestingly, there is a video from Mythbusters from about a decade ago that tried to simulate this using this model you see right here. And interestingly enough, they were able to create a little bit of a push by turning the fan left and right, and essentially by blowing into different sides of the sail. Now, it's not entirely clear if they could produce the same effects in a more enclosed environment. Chances are that it's not going to work. But in this particular case, it worked and it was a very interesting experiment. I'm going to link one of the videos in the description below. And so, is something similar happening in this case? Is there some sort of an unusual effect that we can't really think of right now that seems to be generating a little bit of force by having two sides that are different in size? And if so, how exactly does it work and what's really producing the thrust? Well, first of all, several experiments have already been conducted um, a few years ago, with the bigger one being from NASA and another one being uh, from a Chinese university, and both of them initially claimed to have some positive results. And because the NASA's experiment was conducted in an um, almost complete vacuum, meaning that no air pressure and no airflow would be responsible for any of this, a few years ago, because of this experiment, a lot of people started talking about EM drive once again. But a lot of physicists and a lot of scientists were not convinced, because there was still this violation of momentum. And more importantly, because neither the original engineer nor the NASA scientists here had any explanation for what's happening here. One of the potential explanations was essentially from the quantum physics field. The British scientist who I previously mentioned in my quantized inertia video tried to explain this by using the so-called Casimir effect. Now, this is actually a well-known effect uh, where we know that there is a slight pressure, or to be more specific, a sort of similar idea known as the unruh radiation. And we know that Casimir effect does actually exist, and we know that it does work, but it produces really, really small amounts of pressure. 
So for example, if I were to place really, really thin plates right here next to each other with extremely small space between them, on the inside between the plates, the amount of different particles or specifically virtual particles created is going to be less than the amount of virtual particles on the outside. Or basically there's going to be a lot more radiation pressure coming from the outside than there's going to be coming from the inside. This is actually the result of the quantum physics where we know that different virtual particles are created even in complete vacuum. And if there is less particles on the inside compared to the outside, there is going to be slight pressure. Now this Casimir effect is extremely minuscule though. And it still doesn't necessarily explain what exactly is happening with this particular drive and how any of this produces pressure in this case. Actually, Mike McCullough tried to explain it, but so far the experimental evidence does not support his proposition. And apart from the NASA's attempt, as I mentioned, China has also tried to create something and was partially successful according to the scientists behind the study. With China's Academy of Space and Technology even claiming that they were going to test this in space um, to see if it actually works and possibly even placing it on all of the satellites in the future. But the thing is, this was like five years ago and since then, no new developments. As a matter of fact, complete silence. But at the same time, only a few months ago, Roger Shorer himself once again tried to present his new ideas and talk about how his device seems to be working and even claim that we can one day create these beautiful spacecraft that can travel extremely fast or possibly even create an engine that can actually function without any fuel by literally replacing the engines we currently use and taking us to orbit around planet Earth without any fuel. All of this sounds like a really grand proposition, but according to his calculations, it might work. Well, okay, time to get a little bit more skeptical. So first of all, Shore's explanation so far still does not explain the reasons why it works or actually explains anything that would make any sense in terms of the preservation of momentum. He tries to explain it in several videos, but unfortunately he's missing some crucial points there. More importantly, even in NASA's science paper, despite the measurements of slight force, very tiny force, of several micronewtons per kilowatt, which by the way represents an extremely tiny force, but force nonetheless, one of their own explanations does actually involve temperature change. In other words, they kind of suggested that maybe what they're seeing is not really happening inside of this cavity, but it's actually happening because the device warmed up and because things got deformed slightly, producing slight force simply because the measurement devices were slightly deformed. And because the only other reasonable explanation here is either completely new physics or physics that are broken in some way, a lot of scientific community and a lot of explanations did actually involve potential errors or measurement problems when it came to the actual setup. Which is exactly what the scientists behind three recent papers decided to do. They tried to recreate a relatively similar setup to what NASA had and to what the Chinese scientists did and then decided to use a slightly different suspension points on the same type of an engine. And their somewhat simple yet somewhat brilliant setup allowed them to once and for all prove that EM drive indeed does not work. Because by using this exact same setup, first they were able to recreate exactly the same thrust observations as the team from NASA, but then they were also able to completely remove it by changing to a slightly different suspension system. So in other words, when a different mounting configuration was used here, there was absolutely nothing visible in terms of any more thrust. Whereas thrust was produced when the device was mounted in the same way that the NASA did it. Which of course means that the best explanation so far is really the temperature. Because there is so much power flowing into this device and because so much heat is generated inside, this seems to also affect the device or the scales used to measure the force. It warps the scale just a little bit, putting it into a completely new zero point, which when measured then appears like there is some kind of a pressure going on on the inside. And so by rearranging the device and by choosing a different mounting point, all of these effects suddenly disappear completely. But naturally, the original creator, Roger Shorer, is not really happy with this explanation and have already suggested that either the design was wrong or that they basically misunderstand how this device works. Although, to be honest, I don't think anybody knows how this device works, if it works at all. But realistically speaking though, it's been 20 years and we still haven't created anything that seems to work and all of the recent experiments show that it was basically a measurement error. Which is often the case when unusual and physics breaking announcements are made. Which would also explain why China hasn't mentioned anything in the last five years. They probably realized it was a huge measurement error and because the discovery was probably kind of embarrassing, they decided to just kind of uh, brush it away. 
Now, so does this mean that the EM drive and the so-called impossible drive is impossible? Yeah, it looks like it is. It, it looks like there's nothing in there that seems to work, and it does seem like it was basically just a major mistake in terms of calculations. However, it still doesn't mean we should stop trying to discover these drives. I mean, technologies like this can potentially exist. I mean, for all we know, maybe there is a way for us to somehow use the Casimir effect or the Anru radiation to propel these devices. But at the moment, every single experiment that was scientifically rigorous pretty much confirmed that this doesn't really work. And if such a device could work, we still haven't discovered it. In other words, physics has not been broken. It was most likely just a calculation mistake. And things like that happen all the time. And so on that note, I guess 20 years later, we can finally forget about the EM drive. It was a cool little thing, cool little proposition, but unfortunately, it's not really physics. It's more like science fiction. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this new groundbreaking achievement in regards to nuclear fusion. Coming out of this facility in the United States that has been trying to achieve this for decades, National Ignition Facility. And specifically, we're going to be discussing their new experiment that has actually reached a threshold where we can almost produce just as much energy as we put into it. The threshold that's usually referred to as the ignition, which today represents a kind of a holy grail for the nuclear fusion. But because this is a relatively complex topic with research that's been going on for nearly 60 years now, there's quite a lot to dissect here. And I'm actually not going to be able to cover everything in this video. I am, however, going to be able to cover the important parts in regards to this experiment, and we'll talk more about other experiments in some of the future videos. First of all, the purpose of the experiment, nuclear fusion. So essentially, since the discovery that you can basically release a lot of energy through the atomic reaction and the creation of the nuclear bomb, scientists pretty quickly realized we can also use this to create a lot of energy for civil use. This was the formation of the first nuclear reactors. But all modern nuclear reactors use what's known as fission. Not to be confused with fission. Here we're talking about a nuclear process when a somewhat complex and somewhat heavy element splits into two lighter elements and at the same time releases a lot of energy, with the most commonly used element being uranium. But following the atomic bomb, the next more destructive weapon was the H-bomb, the hydrogen bomb. And in simple terms, the way that this bomb functions is by essentially using the uranium to first create the fission-based explosion that then uses all of this energy to initiate what's known as the fusion-based explosion. It essentially uses the hydrogen inside the bomb to initiate the same reaction that we usually detect inside our sun, which is why sometimes nuclear bombs are also known as the miniature suns, releasing a tremendous amount of energy in the process. But naturally, it also meant that we could hypothetically use this type of a process to create an even more powerful and more efficient nuclear reactor. Something that theoretically made a lot of sense, and a lot of scientists thought it was going to be possible within only a few decades. But this was back in the 60s. Since then, pretty much every attempt to create some sort of fusion reactor unfortunately failed, for one reason or another. And it's not that it failed because the theory was wrong. It failed because once they started building those reactors, they realized how difficult it is to maintain the constant reaction, but also how difficult it is to create a reactor where you actually get more energy out than you put into the reactor itself. Nevertheless, in the last few decades, several major theories in regards to nuclear fusion reactors have actually been proposed and successfully tested. Pretty much all of them seem to work successfully. The only problem being that the energy we put into them is still more than the energy that comes out. And of all different models and theories that are used for fusion reaction, there are two models or two reactors that are actually most well known and that are eventually believed to reach what's known as the ignition. The point at which the reactor starts producing way more energy than we use to run the reactor itself. And so what are these two main models? Well, the most popular one, and the one that's usually seen as the stereotype of fusion reaction, is what's known as the toroidal fusion reactor, also known as the magnetic confinement reactor. The way this works is on the principle of having a lot of superheated hydrogen plasma that spins really, really fast inside a very, very powerful magnet and eventually reaches temperatures and pressures that are even higher than inside our sun. And this starts producing the hydrogen fusion energy. We sometimes refer to these reactors as tokamak, 
and there are quite a lot of them around the world, and a lot of them have been used in various experiments for the past 60 years. Pretty much all of them were quite successful, but none of them have reached ignition just yet. But we'll talk more about this particular reactor and its successes both in the US, Europe and China in one of the future videos that's going to be coming out pretty soon. So make sure to subscribe. Anyway. These tokamak reactors are definitely extremely interesting, but in this video we're actually going to be discussing this other idea, this other type of a reactor that uses something almost entirely different. Something that was initially believed to not really work, but something that turned out to be quite effective. So instead of a tokamak that uses a very powerful magnetic coil and produces ridiculously powerful magnetic plasma, the new experiment used a very different method, a method using these tiny hydrogen pellets and a method referred to as the inertial confinement fusion. And so how exactly does this work? Well, the idea here comes from essentially seeing how it works in the H-bombs, in hydrogen bombs. When the scientists were studying the reactions inside nuclear bombs, specifically inside hydrogen bombs, they realized that if you were to take the hydrogen pellet and make it small enough, at some point you would only require approximately 1.6 megajoules of energy to initiate the nuclear reaction and to make it explode producing more energy than you would actually require to put in. Because of this, they realized that there should be a way for the scientists to create a relatively simple and potentially relatively effective way to initiate the fusion reactor and to produce energy using a series of relatively powerful lasers. Lasers pointed directly at the tiny pellet that are then used to fuse all of the hydrogen inside this pellet, turning it into helium. Although, okay, quick side note, the actual process is a little bit more complicated. You obviously have to first take hydrogen and turn it into slightly heavier hydrogen, known as deuterium, because it becomes much easier for these two atoms to then overcome the electrostatic repulsion known as the Coulomb barrier. And the more neutrons there are compared to protons, the easier it becomes to initiate the nuclear reaction. And so for nuclear fusion, usually much heavier elements such as deuterium and tritium are used instead of pure hydrogen. Also, unlike in our sun, where an average atom of hydrogen can actually exist for billions of years and really not go through any reaction, in order to create practical energy out of a fusion reactor, this rate must be increased quite dramatically, which is usually done through a dramatic increase of heat and pressure inside the reactor, making it somewhat similar to some of the more giant fast-burning stars that usually go through their hydrogen really quickly. And so there's actually a kind of a requirement in temperature and pressure for a successful artificial fusion reactor. Today it's officially known as the Lawson Criterion. And this Lawson Criterion is the reason why a practical fusion reactor still does not exist. We're slowly getting closer and closer to the pressures and temperatures needed. But remember, to create these temperatures and pressures, we have to put a lot of energy in. And because of this, all fusion reactors in operation today require more energy to be put in than they actually produce after the reaction starts. And this is why after nearly 60 years, we still don't really have a functioning fusion reactor, but we are inching closer and closer to that ignition process, the process when we produce more energy than is being put in. With the recent experiment at the National Ignition Facility so far being the most successful of them all, reaching the point where we theoretically can actually say that it reached ignition, even though officially it only produced approximately 70% of energy that was being introduced into the reactor. So here's how this particular process works. First of all, the facility itself is pretty large, but the main part of the facility is right here in this little sphere. And this is what the sphere sort of looks like. It contains nearly 200 different powerful lasers, with each of the lasers being amplified by these really, really powerful devices, that are then focused on this tiny point right here. And that point contains the hydrogen pellet. And so basically all of these lasers are supposed to fire at the pellet at the same time, heating it up equally from each side, which then initiates the nuclear fusion reaction inside the pellet, turning it into a miniature sun, which all happens in just three nanoseconds. But the problem is that you have to have extremely accurate lasers and they have to produce extremely accurately measured and also extremely well controlled type of light. That's very difficult to achieve with 200 lasers. And so to kind of cheat and also make things easier, the pellets are usually put inside this little chamber that's known as the whole room. And it's meant to sort of make things a little bit easier because it ends up distributing the light from the lasers that then distribute the light, turning it into x-rays that shine on the pellet pretty much equally from every side. 
which then initiates the reaction. So all of this theoretically works perfectly. But the problems start arising from each individual step. So for example, the fact that each of the lasers has to be amplified and a lot of them have to be shining at the same point. Also, everything inside the chamber has to be extremely accurately measured and has to be arranged in a very specific way. Also, the pallet itself and also the whole realm have to be made with extreme precision. Even a tiny, tiny perturbation inside of one of these uh, components can actually end up producing quite a lot of different instabilities that end up reducing the total amount of energy released, mostly due to various shockwaves formed inside the pallet. And so in the past, this precision was almost impossible to achieve. But in the last few decades, we've gotten to the point where lasers are really accurate, they're really precise, they're also really powerful, as are a lot of other components used in various devices needed for this to function. And because of this, there's been a lot of progress in regards to these particular fusion reactors. And so a lot of these different inefficiencies have been slowly overcome using new technology. So for example, in the beginning, the actual laser amplification required a lot of energy. The laser amplification process, basically making lasers more powerful, would end up wasting about 99% of all of the energy put in. But over time, these numbers have dramatically improved, making this a lot more efficient. And so back in 2018, approximately three years ago, the scientists from this facility were able to achieve approximately 54 kilojoules of energy released from the pellet. Now, three years later, they've just announced crossing the barrier of one megajoule, 1.3 megajoule to be exact, which is about 25 times more than three years ago, and is roughly equivalent to about 80% of the energy that was being introduced into the reactor. And that is actually great news. It does suggest that maybe in a few years from now, they will cross what's known as the ignition. They will achieve the ability to produce more energy than is being introduced into the reactor. Or, in other words, they might finally have the first artificial fusion reactor. And that will, of course, be a great achievement. But let's not get too excited yet. There are still so many problems. One of the problems here is, of course, the cost. So at the moment, the way this experiment is set up, the reactor can only fire once per day. That is not going to be enough to power anything. A functioning fusion reactor that's going to be powering a city is going to have to fire these lasers pretty much every second. The other issue is with the cost and the production of pellets. They have to be manufactured using extremely precise methods. And so each of these pellets is sort of expensive. But they have to cost only a few cents for this technique to be viable in producing energy for a city or a country. And also replacing these pellets has to be almost instantaneous. Although previously one solution to this has been proposed as a kind of a droplet system, where the pellets basically just drop from somewhere on top and as they descend, they are ignited to produce energy, and then the next droplet is introduced. Nevertheless, even if such system is developed, and we find a way to make these pallets relatively cheap, there are still going to be so many other issues to solve. With most of these issues really being in regards to the inefficiency of different lasers, and inefficiency of energy extraction. But this doesn't change the fact that this is still an extremely intriguing and very important experiment. And if not for practical reasons, possibly for scientific reasons. It definitely can create opportunities to study what happens inside different stars and of course inside our sun as well. But more importantly, it serves as a proof that nuclear fusion on Earth is possible if we find a way to create an efficient laser-based system with relatively cheap to produce pallets. And as you know from history, every single major achievement and a lot of modern technology has always started with some sort of a really important experiment. So this right here is probably not an exception. Once the scientists are successful in achieving ignition, which will probably happen in a few years from now, it will definitely serve as a very important first step in achieving an actual nuclear fusion that we can use for clear energy. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and it looks like we're going to be talking about Perseverance rover once again. NASA is really on the roll. Yet another incredible achievement has been accomplished by the mission, something that has never been done on any planet or any moon or really anywhere else outside of planet Earth. Something that involves this beautiful and unusual box you see right here. But before that, let's also quickly investigate this newly released video by NASA that shows us the dust cloud as the helicopter took off on the first powered flight on another planet only a few days ago. You can find the enhanced version of this video in the description below, but here you can actually see quite a large plume of dust um, as the helicopter takes off, and another slightly smaller plume of dust when the helicopter lands. 
Something that I guess is kind of expected, but nevertheless is pretty cool to see, because it's on another planet. But anyway, so what's in a box and what did NASA achieve? Well, this particular video and this particular mission relates to something known as in-situ resource utilization, also known as ISRU for short. One example of this would be some sort of an autonomous robotic excavation and processing of Martian soil in order to, for example, extract water or even construct the buildings where the future astronauts will be living. At the same time, it also involves the production and storage of various cryogenic materials such as oxygen and methane, which would then be used by rockets landing on Mars in order to take the astronauts either to other parts of the solar system or, obviously, back to planet Earth. And there are actually quite a lot of other ISRU concepts that NASA already has in development, many of them for the lunar mission and a lot of them are for the Martian mission. But the idea is pretty simple. You want to be able to create resources from the stuff that's already where you're going. Obviously so that you don't have to bring all of this stuff with you wherever you are going. So for example, if we land on the moon, we want to be able to produce water, oxygen and possibly even food directly on the moon so that we don't actually have to haul it there all the way back from Earth, mostly because every single pound that we bring with us is actually really expensive. But naturally you want to start small, you want to start with baby steps, and you also want to start with small experiments that you bring along with other missions. With the Ingenuity helicopter being one of these missions, and the device known as MOXIE being the other. And this one here is a lot more exciting. Because once again NASA just made history only a few days after making the history with the first flight. They were able to convert some of the Martian carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Oxygen that can naturally be used for breathing, that can be used for production of fuel, and oxygen that was essentially produced from the resources available on Mars. And remember, Martian atmosphere for the most part is predominantly carbon dioxide, roughly around 95%. And this is how all of this compares to Venus and Earth. But Martian atmosphere is also very thin. It's less than 1% of the atmospheric pressure of Earth atmosphere. And so there's not a lot of CO2, but whatever is there, is there for us to use. And because Martian atmosphere is basically carbon and two oxygens, naturally there is a way for us to try to take some of the oxygen from carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen we can breathe. Or in, in some sense, you can almost think of it as reverse photosynthesis. And one of the ways we can actually take some of the oxygen away is by applying heat plus electricity to the CO2 molecule. By doing this, the oxygen does separate from the molecule, allowing us to then maybe transport it into something else. And so over the past few years, the scientists have found a pretty interesting technique that's described in many different papers, including the two I'm posting in the description below, that allows us to use nothing but electricity, heat, and a thin layer of what's known as Scandia doped zirconia ceramics that has a very specific role of extracting the oxygen ions. In this case, it's two oxygen ions with negative charge, which is first produced in this layer right here, where the CO2 is converted into carbon monoxide and the oxygen ion by applying really, really hot temperatures of about 800 degrees Celsius and by also running a current through this to separate the molecule. And as the O2 ion goes through this layer, it then gets attracted to the next layer which is positive in charge, and since the negatively charged oxygen ion is attracted to the positively charged anode, it then acquires two electrons from this anode and becomes normal oxygen. And so out of two carbon dioxide molecules, you get two carbon monoxide molecules and one molecule of oxygen. And because all of this can then be sort of layered and sandwiched into a relatively large structure, this relatively small device is actually capable of producing approximately 10 grams of oxygen per hour. Now, currently it only produced 5 grams as a test, so basically half its hourly capacity. But at its maximum capacity, it can hypothetically produce enough oxygen for an astronaut to do normal activities for roughly around 20 minutes or so. So in other words, for every astronaut you would want to have at least three but possibly even more of these in order to function properly. But this is a small version and also this is just a test. So naturally being able to produce 5.37 grams of oxygen on the first try is a huge success. Which of course suggests that this technique works and it works really well. And considering the fact that I only heard about MOXIE for the first time back in 2013 when NASA only theoretically started thinking about it, it's sort of mind-blowing to think that after about 7 years, or I guess 8 years, 
they were able to not just make it, but also land it on Mars and already test it, establishing the fact that this technique works really well and will definitely allow the scientists to use the atmosphere of Mars to easily produce quite a lot of resources right there on site. Or at least in this case, to produce oxygen. And oxygen is already needed for breathing, but it's also needed as an oxidizer for a typical rocket. And so in this case, the rocket that you see right here is actually using liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen mix in order to propel itself from the planet. And so technically, we're already half there. We just need to figure out the hydrogen part now. But this was just the first step. Now, the next few steps are going to involve more advanced tests. So first of all, one of the major tests here is going to be testing MOXIE in different atmospheric conditions depending on, for example, storms, depending on different pressures, and of course different temperatures on the surface of Mars. Is it going to be able to function just as well, no matter what the conditions are? And since Mars also has seasons, like planet Earth, it's also going to be important to test this in approximately a year from now when the temperatures are going to be a lot colder. As a matter of fact, you can almost say that Mars has not four, but six seasons. It obviously has spring, winter, fall, and uh, summer, but it also has a season that some scientists refer to as perihelion and aphelion. This is related to the closest location to the sun and the farthest location from the sun. Because naturally, when Mars is closer to the sun, it's going to be overall warmer. And so testing Moxie at different times of the Martian year, which lasts for something like 690 Earth days, is really important in order to establish if it's going to be working all year long. Maybe there are certain conditions where it's not going to function well. But the scientists are really trying to push Moxie to its limits, and they're also going to be testing it in different temperatures and also different environments, depending on where Rover is located. And this is done so that we can establish the baseline for the production of oxygen and also establish any possible, as scientists call them, wrinkles or basically possible errors in order to be aware of what this device can do and what it can't do. And so overall, this whole process will take roughly around two years. And after two years, we'll hopefully have either a complete confirmation that MOXIE works as expected, or we might find some things that don't work as well. But for now, all we know is that the oxygen seems to be generated and generated quite well. And all of this thanks to this unusual layer you see in between of the materials known as ceramic oxides that at high temperatures start to attract or start to conduct oxygen ions. So if it wasn't for this particular material, this would never actually work. But the study that I posted in the description below suggests that technically, the way that the MOXIE device is designed right now, it hypothetically is capable of producing enough oxygen. And here we're talking about approximately 25 tons of oxygen, or around 55,000 pounds, that would be able to deliver a rocket back to planet Earth. And that's of course without replacing anything on the inside. And that amount of oxygen a single person usually uses in roughly around 70 years or so. So that's basically a life supply of oxygen for an average individual. Although obviously using one of these would be unrealistic. It would take close to 300 years and by then, um, well, the batteries used on the rover would no longer be operational. Either way, the important thing is that it works and it works pretty well. But now the goal is going to be to discover when it doesn't work. What conditions is it going to be malfunctioning in? So that's pretty much the mission for the next two years. And that's exactly what the scientists are going to try to uncover with the main goal being pushing MOXIE to its limits. But we can of course also extract oxygen from these ice caps you see right here. Although according to the scientists behind this paper, it's a lot more effective to just use MOXIE. Apparently producing oxygen from the atmosphere itself is a lot more feasible and might require a lot less energy than by using electrolysis to do it from water ice or by extracting it from the ground. And so when it comes to Mars exploration and Mars colonization, there is a chance we might have solved at least one problem, the problem of generating oxygen. But there are obviously so many problems to go and so many things we need to still consider. Hello info person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the news coming from NASA itself. Because the famous Parker Solar Probe that was launched to study the Sun a few years ago has finally crossed the threshold where it sort of unofficially touched the sun. At least that's what NASA called it. And that's because it actually passed through the part of the sun that we refer to as Corona. In the process, discovering some really interesting things about the sun. And so let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, but I guess let's start with the idea of the structure of the sun 
And why exactly NASA refer to this as touching the sun? So first of all, unlike planets, the sun itself obviously does not have a solid surface. And the region around the sun that we kind of refer to as the surface of the sun is essentially composed of different convection cells of plasma, and it's actually known as the photosphere. And all of these cells in the photosphere are formed by the convective zone right underneath the surface. This relatively large zone you see right here that starts at around 70% the radius of the sun. Underneath it you'll find the radiative zone, where most of the heat transfer occurs in one direction, it's radiated out, whereas in the convective zone it circulates around, creating what's known as the convection cells. Here's another way of looking at this from the side view, and so essentially in the convective zone a lot of this circulates around, producing the cells we see on the surface, and the radiation zone here simply radiates the heat away. With the core itself being right in the middle, and that's where all of the nuclear reaction occurs. But notice how even in this image, there's something else right above the photosphere, the corona. And it's this corona that the Parker Solar Probe recently got to touch, or essentially pass directly through it. Making this a really important and somewhat groundbreaking achievement, because in essence it is like touching the sun, because like I mentioned before, the sun doesn't really have a true surface. As a matter of fact, the corona itself can be seen as the top of that surface as well, if you were to sort of use gravity as the definition of where the surface starts. This is actually one of the many images produced by different astronomers, showing us exactly where corona sort of starts, and it's usually seen during the total solar eclipse. And first of all, well, the thing is, we don't really understand much about this region at all. One of the biggest mysteries discovered a few decades ago is that apparently Corona is much, much, much hotter than the surface or the photosphere of the Sun. The photosphere only reaches a few thousand degrees in temperature. Corona, on the other hand, increases in temperature up to 2 million degrees Fahrenheit, or just over a million degrees Kelvin. This video from the University of Michigan explains this in a little bit more detail. And so by modern definition, the surface of the sun, in a sense, is really the end of the corona. And it's because right beyond this point right here, that's where the solar wind emerges and starts blowing out a lot of different charged particles all across the solar system. And so for many years now, the scientists have been trying to figure out, so first of all, where exactly does this corona begin? And where exactly does the official surface of the sun stop? And this particular region today has a name. It's known as the Alphen Point. Named after this wonderful person, Hannes Alfen, the Swedish electrical engineer and Nobel Prize winner, who essentially defined the ideas behind so-called Alfen waves and explained a lot of phenomena in plasma physics as well. And so in modern solar studies, a lot of the investigations suggested that this so-called Alfen critical point lies approximately 10 to maybe 20 radii of the Sun away from the center of the Sun. And one of their primary reasons for this mission was to actually discover what exactly is happening in the corona, where it starts, and any other potential mysteries we might discover while doing all of this. And it really didn't take this probe very long to discover some of the major mysteries around the solar corona, but already find some of the solutions to these mysteries as well. And more importantly, in April of 2021, it officially passed through the corona, defining its limit, with the limit currently established at being approximately 19.7 radii. But it's really important to understand that this is not a permanent or a solid structure. It always changes, it also changes with the activity from the sun, and more importantly, it actually is somewhat unequal in shape. In other words, the corona itself is not truly spherical. It sort of wobbles around, it has a lot of different instabilities, and so even though the initial radius was 19.7 solar radii, it did drop down to about 18.4 solar radii, so it does change quite a lot. And that's equivalent to a distance of about 13 to maybe 14 million kilometers, or roughly around 40 times the distance of the moon from planet Earth. But also because this is just the first approach, and there are going to be 26 close approaches in the next few years, it's going to allow us to investigate this in more detail and possibly discover a lot more things about the solar corona as well. As a matter of fact, the probe is going to be using Venus for an assist maneuver or a slingshot maneuver to decrease its speed even more and to drop even lower toward the sun, or basically enter the corona at an even deeper level, allowing us to possibly find even more stuff. And this time, it looks like the probe got to spend roughly around 5 hours inside the solar atmosphere or the solar corona, allowing the scientists to take some really interesting pictures and interesting videos, with some of them visible right here. This is an intriguing picture of what the scientists are referring to as the coronal streamers, 
the powerful streams of magnetic particles that are usually seen when we take pictures of the solar corona, but this time it was seen by flying directly through them. And at the same time, the probe also got to measure the magnetic field and even sample some of the particles present in both regions. And a lot of these early measurements clearly suggested that, as we suspected, the often critical point, the surface of the Sun, is not smooth at all, it's extremely wrinkled. And it looks like it's these streamers right here that seem to influence the overall shape of the surface of the Sun itself, or the often critical surface. Or at least that's the initial implication here. In other words, the surface of the solar corona was clearly deformed, but it's just not clear what exactly is causing these deformations. Interestingly though, when the probe was inside these streamers, everything seemed to have calmed down. But as soon as you leave one of these streamers, everything becomes extremely chaotic. On the other hand, during its passage, it also finally got to investigate these unusual phenomena you see right here, known as the switchbacks. It's essentially a kind of an unusual magnetic field phenomenon, where the field itself seems to kind of switch back and forth as the probe is flying through it. And it wasn't really clear what exactly forms this, or at least it wasn't clear until relatively recently. Now, through the investigations of the surface of the Sun, the scientists realized that a lot of these switchbacks are most likely from the actual cells in the photosphere, and the most likely way that they're produced is from the cell interaction that ends up producing a lot of funnels between them, and the very hectic interaction between these funnels. Or at least that's the initial explanation for now. Chances are that as probe passes close to the sun even more, we might be able to discover the true origin of these unusual phenomena. Although interestingly, this is probably one of the main reasons why solar wind is produced and how it's able to spread beyond the solar corona. These unusual imperfections and a lot of these interactions between the cells and these various switchbacks end up creating so many imperfections on the surface of the solar corona that some of the wind ends up escaping which then travels across the solar system. But with time and with help from Venus, the probe is going to end up approaching the Sun even closer. As a matter of fact, roughly around 1 million miles or about 1,500,000 kilometers closer than the current record as of December of 2021. So basically, we only have more to learn and by the time that it reaches the record, it's going to be about 9.8 solar radii away from the Sun which will definitely help the scientists figure out all of these mysteries behind the solar wind, behind the solar corona, and possibly answer a lot of questions we could never really answer. For example, can we actually use these probes and observations from the surface of the sun to basically predict all of the solar system weather, cosmic weather, or solar weather? Because of the effects from various coronal mass ejections, predicting solar weather today, especially for the future of humanity if we want to end up traveling across the solar system, is extremely important. Some of these coronal mass ejections are so powerful that they can easily disrupt even some of the most well-protected spacecraft or colonies on Mars or on the Moon. And so this probe, the Parker Solar Probe, is actually one of the more important missions NASA has launched in the last few decades. By being able to predict the solar weather, we'll definitely prepare ourselves better here on planet Earth and for the interplanetary travel as well. But all of this means learning more about the Sun itself, understanding its corona, and figuring out what parts of the Sun are responsible for creating a lot of these powerful emissions that we usually refer to as coronal mass ejection. But I guess for now, the mystery of corona and the mystery of various events in the corona are still not truly well understood. It's only been a couple of years since we discovered some of these really unusual phenomena and it will probably take a few more years to finally conclusively explain all of this and how all of this works around our sun and of course around other stars as well. Although I guess by being able to touch the sun finally, it sort of makes it a big deal. The only spacecraft to have achieved that ever. Back in 2017, the scientists using so-called PANSTARS, which was a fast response telescope used to detect certain objects like comets and asteroids, detected this unusual object known today as Oumuamua. And years later, we're still trying to figure out what exactly this was. Hello, wonderful person. Today, we might actually finally have a solution. A very sound scientific solution that does not involve aliens. But before I start, I actually wanted to briefly mention why we had this controversy and this unusual debate about the origins of this object. And without going into details about the object itself, the only reasonable explanation I see to all of this is, well, unfortunately, for the lack of better words, scientific ego. 
The idea of wanting to be that one scientist discovering something absolutely extraordinary somewhere out there and being that first person to mention it, to provide proof for it, and to then basically be in a spotlight because of this. Now, unfortunately, in science this happens quite a lot. And also, unfortunately, in science, because of this, there are two main problems. One of the main problems with this is that eventually this causes the public to lose faith and to lose any kind of confidence in scientific discoveries, in scientific community, and in scientists in general. Second of all, the problem with this mentality is that this creates a kind of a race to try to be that one person to discover something incredible so that you can be in the spotlight. Which also often ends up in people making a lot of mistakes in the process and then basically becoming a kind of a pariah or just losing their job completely. Now that's not exactly what I wanted to focus on, but it's really important to understand that when trying to figure out what we're looking at, it's super important in science not to jump to conclusions, especially when those conclusions can be explained by any other reasonable means. And even though we all really want to believe in extraterrestrial intelligence and a lot of us actually are convinced the aliens are somewhere out there, trying to explain a phenomenon that can be explained in different ways by basically implying that it's probably alien intelligence is actually a somewhat irresponsible thing to do. At least for scientists. It is totally okay if you're not a scientist though, but if you are in the scientific community, it is extremely important to be very prudent in investigating your claims and in trying to avoid turning a hypothesis into an actual fact, because that's what's been happening with a lot of new discoveries in the last few decades. Planet 9 right here being the other culprit. But anyway, despite all of this, I still wanted to really talk about this object, because the new paper in some sense is kind of brilliant. And in some sense it's actually extremely interesting to read what the scientists had to say. But first of all, let's actually talk about the shape of Oumuamua, because what I've been showing you so far is this really unusual cigar-like shape. But a lot of scientists today do not believe this was the shape at all. As a matter of fact, a lot of new studies, including the study I talked about a few years ago, determined that the shape probably looks something similar to what you see right here. A kind of a flat pancake-like shape, or in some sense it also looks like basically a bar of soap after you use it for a very long time. Which is actually an important analogy because we're going to come back to this in a few minutes. But unfortunately, because all of the illustrations so far have been made using this shape, I'm going to have to use this just to illustrate my point. So we know that this object came into the solar system moving at a velocity slightly lower than would be expected from a typical interstellar object. What this implies, according to the scientists, is that this object probably wasn't really traveling for a very long time across the interstellar space. The suggestion here being that it's maybe about 500 million years tops, possibly even less than that. We also believe that it originally entered the outer solar system roughly around the year 1605, so essentially in the beginning of the astronomy, and it's probably going to leave, officially leave the solar system by the year 2430, moving at a speed of about 26.3 kilometers per second. Now one of the more unusual features of this object was of course its light curve, for some reason, this is what the scientists observed, which they interpreted as the object tumbling around as it was basically moving through the solar system. But the actual shape has been debated ever since. At first it was a cigar shape, later on scientists actually worked out that it was probably more of a disc shape. But so far nothing really makes this object unusual. But then something happened that the scientists didn't expect. As they started to observe this object leaving the solar system, they realized that there was a slight deviation between the observed orbit and the expected orbit. Now for comets that's actually totally not unusual. We expect the comets, as they emit a lot of material from their core, generally start to change their orbit and trajectory just a little bit. And usually this is correlated with the cometary tail itself. But what made Oumuamua different is that the cometary tail was not observed at all. And so the trajectory here was changing, yet at the same time, the tail was not observed anywhere. And because of this, well, that's where this explanation came from. And honestly, at least scientifically, this still kind of doesn't make sense. Because there are so many other better explanations. With two papers that you can find in the description below, probably being the best explanation we have so far. And in the paper, there are really only two main assumptions that are being made. One of them is that it was definitely a pancake shape. And the second explanation, well, it's actually in this image to some extent. It's the color of the object mixed with the idea of what it's actually made out of. It was not made from the same material as typical comets would detect 
such as the famous 2020 Neowise Comet, which usually are made out of different frozen gases, all sorts of water ices, and also carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane and ammonia. A lot of these gases are usually visible and also emit certain types of colors as we look at them when the sun illuminates them from the distance. But we also know that there are a lot of objects out there in the outer solar system, such as for example objects in the same vicinity and in the same orbit as beautiful Pluto right here, that actually are made out of something different. Something that gives Pluto this beautiful reddish color. That's nitrogen ice. A lot of this red stuff you see on the surface, that's basically nitrogen ice. And that's something that evaporates very differently from the material that usually is present in most comets. And so, in other words, what the scientists in this paper imply was that it was actually a chunk of nitrogen ice, most likely separated from some distant Pluto-like object in another star system. Or in other words, it was basically a chunk of exoplanetary Pluto, or exopluto, exodwarf planet, whatever you want to call it. With a very elegant explanation provided in this illustration right here. So all of this starts possibly about 400 to 500 million years ago, as something collides with a distant Pluto-like object in another star system and essentially ejects this really large piece that eventually escapes into the outer star system or essentially into the interstellar space. Now originally this chunk was probably more circular in shape, but with time, because of the way that nitrogen interacts with cosmic rays for example, it slowly eroded through various types of radiation and in some sense, just like your soap in your bathroom, eventually becomes kind of flattened. Now you've all seen this before, as you rub the soap around and as you basically use it over the next few weeks, it eventually becomes really really flat. Same mechanism applies to what happened here. It then enters the solar system, approaches the closest point to the sun in 2017, and then eventually makes its way out of the solar system, and just a few months later we're able to see it with a telescope. And those deviations from the orbit were very likely caused by the evaporation of nitrogen ice from the surface. And it just so happens that, well, as nitrogen evaporates, it doesn't actually produce any kind of tails at all. We would not really be seeing this anywhere. And on top of this, because this was a chunk of ice from another dwarf planet, the implication here is that it was probably also a lot more reflective, and thus the object was probably much smaller than we initially assumed. And by being so much smaller, the amount of emissions coming from the object were able to deviate its orbit a lot more than initially predicted. And so by being a reflective chunk of ice, and by also emitting a lot of nitrogen in the process, a lot of the observations of the orbital changes can be easily explained and are easily explained in this particular paper. As a matter of fact, this explanation seems to provide the exact match to everything we've seen so far. Even the reflectivity of this object was very very similar to the reflectivity we usually detect on objects like Pluto and Triton. So in other words, it was definitely a chunk of a dwarf planet or some sort of an object from another star system but from the same region where we usually discover dwarf planets. And the object itself probably came from a relatively young star system that was still being developed, something that just like the solar system in the beginning, experienced a lot of different collisions, which is why this object was probably released in the first place. Which of course also confirms that, well it seems other star systems also have their own dwarf planets that are probably made of the same stuff as Pluto, Triton and a lot of dwarf planets in the solar system. But with recent estimates suggesting that approximately 7 such objects should be passing through the solar system every single year, we now have a great opportunity to possibly discover another one of these objects and study it in a lot more detail before it disappears once again. And despite all of the other assumptions and controversy that this object created, it still is one of the most interesting discoveries of the last decade and is definitely one of those discoveries that a lot of scientists will be talking about years to come. But probably not because of this definitely because of what's in these two papers that you can find in the description below. But unfortunately for now that's kind of all we know. Although for me personally this explanation is more than enough. It provides all of the necessary answers and provides all of the explanations to everything that was seen in this unusual object. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about several topics that I've been fascinated with since I was really really young. The asteroid that led to the demise of dinosaurs combined with the idea behind the tsunami that it created, and more specifically, a mega tsunami. And today we're going to discuss this new research that came out not so long ago that actually discovered some really unusual formations on the bottom of the ocean 
that was very likely produced by the mega tsunami that was created by this asteroid. Something that you sort of see right here in this image, but I'm going to be explaining what exactly you're looking at right here in a few minutes. First of all, we know that the asteroid that collided with the planet 66 million years ago did not just create a tsunami, it had a lot of different effects. Effects that we're still learning about even today. First of all, the debris from the explosion spread around the planet and ended up creating a lot of different wildfires in many different ancient forests. It's actually believed that about 75% of all of the forests burned down within only a few weeks after this. It also released a tremendous amount of various sediments from the seafloor where the asteroid hit the planet and this ended up acidifying the oceans within only a few weeks as well. The acidity of the oceans increased so much that it actually led to the demise of many different ocean organisms. Something that is actually happening today as well, but for a slightly different reason. And then there were also obvious atmospheric effects such as dust storms and just the overall increase in dust in the air, which lowered the temperature of the planet for at least a few decades, which eventually led to the demise of most of the dinosaurs. But because the asteroid hit the ocean near the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, this also naturally created an extremely large tsunami. But not a regular tsunami, not a type of a tsunami we've heard about back in 2004 or the one from Japan in 2011. These types of waves are slightly different and are produced in a very different way as well. Instead, what it created was known as a mega tsunami. And this is an entirely different concept despite a similarity in a name. Mega tsunamis have happened on the planet for different reasons as well, with the most recent one happening in 2015 in Alaska, but we normally don't get any footage of them, and there's also almost no way to predict them or to catch them in the act. They're very sudden, they're extremely quick, and they are extremely destructive. So first, a regular tsunami. Let's watch this video that explains how all of this works. Both of the tsunamis in 2004 and 2011 were a result of some sort of a seismological activity and also were a result of an earthquake. In this case, a displacement by the tectonic plate sort of lifts the layer of the water here and creates a somewhat small but very very fast moving wave across the open ocean. Normally these waves are actually almost invisible unless of course you know what you're looking for. But as they approach the shore and as they get closer and closer to land, they experience a sudden slowdown in their velocity but also a sudden increase in their height. And normally they also come as a kind of a tsunami train as you see right here. And this is what happened in Southeast Asia in 2004 and in Japan in 2011. And so as the wave starts approaching the land, the recession of the ocean right here indicates that a large amount of water is about to strike the land. Now this doesn't really happen right away, it usually takes at least um, a few minutes, possibly even half an hour, but eventually you'll notice how the sudden surge starts to approach the land itself. It's not really a very large wave, sometimes it's really only a few meters in height, but it's a huge amount of water and it's a sudden surge that just keeps coming and coming and coming. Now that's literally what we call a tsunami. And this is exactly what happened both in Japan and in countries like Indonesia. Now this is a very destructive event, but it's not destructive because the wave is tall or because the water is moving fast, it's destructive because there's so much water just that keeps coming and coming and coming. And this can actually last for hours and sometimes even last for many hours. And in some cases it actually repeats several times because of the idea of that tsunami train I showed you previously. But a mega tsunami is something almost entirely different. Here's an example from 1958 from Alaska, probably the most famous mega tsunami known because this one was actually witnessed and survived by two people fishing in this area known as the Lituya Bay, located right here in Alaska. And this particular bay is sort of the epicenter for many of these unusual phenomena known as mega tsunami. It has happened in the past before that. There are actually several amazing videos created by Dr. Stephen Ward, whose channel you can find in the description below, that explain all of this visually by using these brilliant simulations. So here's how a typical mega tsunami is created. It's normally related to a sudden collapse of a large amount of ground or some sort of a underground mudslide or in some cases a very large asteroid suddenly striking in the middle of the ocean. This sudden increase in volume essentially creates something that looks like this. It pushes the water so much that there's suddenly this huge wave that starts moving across with some waves going as high as one kilometer in height and all of these waves 
as you can probably imagine, are extremely destructive. And unlike a typical tsunami here, it's going to be extremely tall, extremely large, even in the open ocean. So here's, for example, one such event from the Capo Verde Islands located in the Atlantic Ocean. Notice how the height of the tsunami here striking the island is basically close to 500 meters in height, or over 1640 feet in height, and that is a huge wave. And so something like this happened in Alaska, and this is probably the most well-known event, but a lot of these happened in the last few decades as well. We'll actually talk more about mega tsunamis in one of the future videos in a lot more detail, so obviously make sure to subscribe not to miss this video, but some of the most powerful and most destructive ones have always happened either in Alaska or close to the coast of Norway. But going back to the original impact that destroyed the dinosaurs, let's watch the simulation by Steven Ward of what it was probably like 65 to 66 million years ago when the asteroid hit the planet. And so in this particular case, we know that it most likely happened somewhere right here. And this created a really large but not super large mega tsunami. In this case, mostly because it was actually hitting shallow waters with the highest peak of the wave itself very likely being less than 300 meters in height. And the waves reaching the North American shore were probably around 20 to 30 meters in height as well. So not as dramatic as we originally thought, one and a half kilometers in height, simply because the water where the asteroid hit was not actually that deep to begin with. But one thing about the tsunami is quite certain, it definitely happened. There are actual signs of deposits coming from various regions around the ocean, that were actually discovered as far away as northern US in some of the regions we'll discuss in one of the previous videos. You can find this video somewhere right there. But over the years, more and more clues about the tsunami have actually been discovered through other unrelated studies. And this is one such study. So this is something that was not actually even studying tsunamis or even doing any scientific research. All of this data was collected by the petroleum industry that's basically been kind of mapping the ocean floor trying to discover more oil deposits somewhere underneath the ground. But 65 million years ago, a big part of the southern US was essentially underwater, including Florida, including parts of Texas, and including, of course, Louisiana. And a lot of this data came from the central Louisiana, where the petroleum industry was basically mapping the ground. And at a depth of approximately one and a half kilometers, they discovered these unusual ripples, the ones you can kind of see right here, they have clearly been preserved in there for millions and millions of years. Now normally these ripples are generated by waves. And you've probably seen these in the ocean. This is sort of the example right here. Notice how there are ripples that are actually created by the water waves. But in order for these ripples to be preserved for millions of years, some kind of a major event had to occur in order for these ripples not to be disturbed for millions of years. Such as, for example, if a tsunami wave created these ripples and then the water in this region was too deep for anything else to disturb it for millions of years afterwards. And so these mega ripples very likely were just preserved by the sediment that deposited in the depth of the ocean and eventually solidified as these ripples we see in this image. But interestingly, originally they did not actually know where these came from. In order to figure this out, they had to sort of trace back the origin of these waves by trying to look where they possibly came from, where the waves came from. And once they traced back the origin of the potential wave, it led them to the site of the original impact 66 million years ago. Now in terms of the actual properties, these mega ripples seem to have a wavelength of approximately 600 meters, which is of course the distance between the two wave crests right here, with the average height of the wave being about 16 meters or so. So obviously not the 1500 meters that was originally assumed by some of the other studies, but actually almost directly matching the simulations from Stephen Ward. With the tsunami itself very likely continuing for possibly hours or possibly even several days. With these ripples in particular representing huge 16 meter waves hitting the relatively shallow shelf near the Louisiana shore and doing so for many many hours. Something that very likely also led to the tremendous amount of sediments being deposited in this particular region. Which means that if one day we somehow are able to retrieve samples from here, we might be able to discover some really really cool sediments and possibly even actual specimens of ancient wildlife that resided in the area. But I guess for now that's kind of all I wanted to mention. It's a pretty cool discovery, it's an amazing confirmation that a tsunami or actually a mega tsunami was created by the collision that happened approximately 66 million years ago 
But more importantly, it helps us understand how these tremendously powerful collisions affect the planet when they do occur. Hello Info Person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing a somewhat fascinating topic of synthetic life, and more specifically, a concept known as Xenobot. In this case, the Xenobot version 3, and it looks like by studying this unusual form of life, or whatever this is, the scientists have discovered the completely new way for living organisms to reproduce and to basically spread their progeny, something that has never been seen in any animal or plant life ever before. And so let's discuss this concept in a little bit more detail, talk a little bit more about Xenobot 3.0, but let's actually start with our unhealthy or maybe somewhat curious fascination with creating new life or just creation in general. I mean, when you think about it, all of the early science fiction was mostly based on the human's fascination with creating something else. We of course have the early 19th century Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Here's the early adaptation of the Frankenstein's monster created by the Edison Studios back in 1910. We even have some of the early drawings and early research from Leonardo da Vinci back in 1495 that essentially resembles some sort of a humanoid robot or a mechanical knight that was able to potentially move his hands, open his jaw, and possibly even move around to some extent, but it's not really clear if this was ever produced or if it was just a mechanical drawing. What is clear though is that a lot of it was based on the da Vinci's fascination with the Vitruvian man and his initial concepts at trying to define the perfection of human body and potentially even recreate it to some extent. With some of the more complex examples of this coming from Japan, this is the so-called Karakuri puppets. The puppets that essentially act like actual humans, but in reality are just these really complex mechanisms, with some of these puppets created for entertainment purposes, but some of them being made to even perform simple duties around the house, such as during the tea ceremony to serve tea. And so for centuries we've had this fascination with creating of something mechanical, something robotic, and something that potentially resembles us. I guess we usually refer to this as an android. But on the other hand there's always been this other fascination of creating life in general, synthetic life. So basically not necessarily a robot or something that resembles us, but something that has similar functions to life, but something that might not really have a definitive use just yet. And so in the last years, a lot of scientists have been working on a lot of different biological systems in order to create what we would refer to as a synthetic life. We've talked about some of these examples in some of the previous videos that should be popping up at some point, but I guess some of the best examples are synthetic yeast, the website for which you can find in the description below, or the so-called Build a Cell Foundation that's essentially trying to recreate a simple cell using nothing but simple building blocks. This was actually one of the most fascinating studies that I've read in the last few years. But the most fascinating study to date, in my opinion, is the Xenobot study. This right here. And this really takes it to a completely next level. This is basically a combination of some of the most advanced studies we have today in order to create synthetic life. Now the word Xenobot itself comes from the name of the frog, the African clawed frog known as Xenopus. A lot of this is made out of cells from this particular frog. Specifically it combines a lot of biological tissues from the frog embryo with tissues then reused for other purposes. Here's sort of in a nutshell how all of this works. Each of these embryos, frog embryos, are used for harvesting of various tissues from the embryos before they develop. A lot of these tissues are going to be used for different types of construction and essentially are used as basic materials. The main purpose in this case is to isolate individual cells and to then use these cells to create something a little bit bigger and a little bit more complex, but something predetermined by the scientists. And the scientists currently refer to this as reconfigurable organisms. With all of this just using two blocks, the passive blocks and the contractile blocks. With the blocks themselves representing two different types of cells from within the frog embryo. The skin cells, whose main purpose is to provide rigid support, and the hard cells that are used for small locomotive purposes, for example for contraction, for moving forward, or to essentially expand the volume. But what makes this concept a little bit more interesting than just poking around with different cells is how all of this is designed. 
All this is then designed by a really complex AI algorithm that provides the design for the most likely successful configuration that's going to work based on the cells provided. In other words, the shape itself, the functionality of this uh, organism, is designed by an artificial intelligence. And it's then assembled using various biological techniques using these cells from the frog embryo. And so basically, the way that this works is, you take a computer simulation, you design something on the computer, make sure that it works in that particular setting, and use each of the individual blocks to recreate this using actual cells. And because of this, currently, well, it's kind of hard to define exactly what's being created. It's not really life, and it's not really a robot. So it's something in between, or something entirely different. And in this case, it's referred to as the programmable organism or a living programmable organism, or simply Xenobot, because that seems to be the best name for this right now. And because this is technically based on a very complex evolutionary algorithm that goes through a lot of different simulations to evolve this organism for certain functions, in some sense, it is kind of life, but just not the life we are used to. And so in the last few years, since the original report of Xenobot 1.0, a lot of new advances have been made in this particular study or in this field of study, and a lot of new things have been discovered, a lot of new functions developed, and more importantly, a lot of new models and designs have been created for very specific different purposes. For example, some of these have been designed to walk, to swim, to push things around, to carry things around, or to basically aggregate a lot of materials, collecting them into one large chunk. On top of this, by design, this organism seems to be able to regenerate itself and to essentially repair its cells even if it's damaged. But nevertheless, it does have a limit to its lifetime, usually a couple of weeks or so. So it's not an immortal organism, it's an organism designed to survive for just long enough to complete its function, but then it sort of disintegrates and becomes nothing but organic matter, simply because these are just simple biological cells from a typical frog. But interestingly enough, despite this being a frog cell with frog DNA on the inside, they don't actually act like frog cells anymore and seem to develop new functions and even produce new effects. More recently, the scientists have even found a way to provide a bit of a memory to these unusual cells by adding an RNA molecule into these cells and essentially giving them a kind of a molecular memory, which helps some of these cells remember certain types of light. But at the moment, these particular studies only have one main purpose, trying to figure out how morphology and building of various structures in our bodies or other bodies works in general. These are essentially study of morphogenesis, building of complex structures and complex bodies. And that's basically what happened with Xenobot 3.0, a completely new design and a completely new function that nobody actually expected. Once again, designed by an AI, with the AI given one single purpose, create something that can then reproduce itself. And for some reason, when creating different shapes, the AI seems to have chosen one shape that was most effective. This shape right here. The shape resembling the iconic character Pac-Man. Now, this is obviously completely by accident, but according to the algorithm used in the study, it's the most effective shape to try to recreate reproduction. And it's really important to understand that reproduction in this case does not mean sexual reproduction or, for example, cloning or copying itself. It just means propagating itself in any way possible. And that was the only purpose of this AI. Develop something that allows for this to happen. In other words, find a way, mathematical way, for something to create something else. And naturally, in biology, at least here on planet Earth, a lot of different types of reproduction has been developed over billions of years, and a lot of it is very familiar to us. We obviously have things like this, where cells just copy themselves. We also obviously have cells that normally require some other cells, which is what we refer to as sexual reproduction. But the algorithm behind Xenobot 3.0 that you can kind of see assembled here discovered something entirely different, a completely new way of reproduction. It's this. The cells assemble themselves from other cells. And they create a clone of themselves by basically pushing blocks around, by pushing cells around. In other words, the reproduction in this case is done by assembling the copy of itself from the things around them. Which in essence is a definition of self-replication. They definitely replicate themselves, but just not in a way that we are familiar with. 
In this particular case, each of these xenobots is swimming around collecting hundreds and hundreds of different cells and then assembling baby xenobots. And all of this is done inside of this unusual Pac-Man-like mouth shape that seems to act as a kind of a shovel-like shape, able to collect things together and able to push them into a certain direction. And after a few days, each of these unusual Pac-Man Xenobots was able to create a somewhat similar Xenobot that was able to perform similar functions. And once again, all this is simply made out of these frog cells, with frog DNA on the inside, but acting in a completely different fashion. Normally, all of these cells on the outside would actually be responsible for sitting outside of the tadpole and mostly protecting the tadpoles from various types of pathogens, but also for distributing various types of mucus and basically acting as a protection for the tadpole itself. But none of these cells, or even the frog's DNA, is able to perform the function performed by the xenobots. So this part right here is developed entirely by itself and essentially is developed by the AI behind the design. More importantly, as mentioned before, this is actually the first time this has ever been seen in any biological entity. We know that some of the molecules assemble this way, but it's never been seen with cells. But what's kind of difficult to explain is how after months of calculations, this particular artificial intelligence came up with a Pac-Man looking shape as the best representation that seems to work in this particular case. For example, why exactly does it have just one big mouth and why not have a bunch of different protrusions everywhere? But having tested this, the scientists are now convinced that the shape seems to work really well. It even creates grandchildren and grand-grandchildren, so this does seem to result in reproduction. And so at the moment, it looks like these xenobots have been able to do a lot of different tasks that are usually done by life itself. They move around, they replicate, but more importantly, they can now be used for potentially practical reasons. One of the biggest applications for this particular technology is helping us with microplastics. Now here I'm not talking about these large chunks of plastics like plastic bags or plastic bottles that in theory you can just pick up and throw away or recycle. I'm talking about microplastics, the stuff that all of this produces as a result. And this is the most dangerous part of current plastic problem. It produces a lot of microplastics that seem to have spread everywhere in the ecosystem. Check out that previous video to learn more, but in essence, there's really no good way for us to currently remove microplastics from the ecosystem. Most of them are just too tiny and are actually accumulating to the extreme amounts in a lot of different species. But by using these xenobots, which by the way are biodegradable and will not actually increase pollution at all, in theory it's possible to have them collect these microplastics and move them into larger and larger chunks, which can then be collected by something else. So that's actually one of the potential practical applications of this really incredible technology. But I'm sure we'll come up with a lot more applications as new versions of Xenobot come out in the future. At the moment, this definitely is one of the most incredible discoveries and one of the most attempts at recreating something synthetic, something lifelike, but something without an actually good definition just yet. It's a programmable, configurable organism, but I guess it's not really life or will ever be life mostly because they're designed with a very specific function in mind and designed by artificial intelligence of all things. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and right here what you're looking at is a picture from back in 2010 that shows us the first ever confirmed Trojan of planet Earth. Now I'm going to explain to you what Trojans are in a few seconds but what's important is that it looks like we found another one. There seem to be two Trojans that planet Earth has, and that is actually kind of fascinating. But like so many other amazing discoveries and amazing stories, this one actually once again starts on Twitter. The amazing amateur astronomer Tony Dunn has actually posted this beautiful picture you see right here that shows us the potential orbit of this incredible new discovery. Now, first of all, what exactly are Trojans and why is this even important? Like so many other unusual objects in the solar system, Trojans are a type of an asteroid. Although more specifically, they're known as minor planets. And if I were to select some of them right here, you would see there's actually quite a lot of them placed in the orbit of Jupiter, or essentially sharing the orbit with Jupiter. And if you ever want to see the total list of these over 9,000 objects, it's actually in the description below. There are quite a lot of them and they all have very different properties. 
But those are only the Jupiter's Trojans we've discovered so far. In reality, there are millions and millions of them, and a lot of them are still hidden. And every planet has their own Trojans. The objects that essentially share the orbit of the planet by getting stuck in these relatively stable points known as Lagrange points. You may have heard of them before, you may have not. There are five of them in total, they're all relatively stable and you can actually take any object, place it there and it's not going to fall back to Earth and it's not going to fall back into the Sun. There's one point right here between the Sun and planet Earth, there's one behind planet Earth, there's one on the opposite side to the Sun and there's also L4 as well as L5, which are roughly around 60 degrees between the planet Earth and the point itself. And all of the Trojans we've found so far are basically in these L4 and L5 points. And by the way, we also use them for different satellites as well. It's very common to place a satellite that, for example, tries to study planet Earth or something away from planet Earth by placing it in these points. But because of the proximity of Saturn to Jupiter and essentially because of the planetary interactions and because Jupiter is really, really massive, so far we actually haven't discovered any Trojans around Saturn. We've discovered one around Uranus, there's I think 28 around Neptune, but Saturn seems to be lacking them. And it's not really because they're just not there, they're probably there or might actually be really small but no major ones have been found. And we believe this is really because of the gravitational interactions with Jupiter, meaning that Jupiter probably just stole all of them and now they are orbiting the other planet. But surprisingly, Mars has nine of them, and you can once again learn more about them in the link in the description below. And that means that Earth has to have some too. Earth is more massive, it also has quite a lot of asteroids approaching it once in a while, so there have to be more Trojans hiding somewhere in there. This is what most scientists believe and this is what a lot of professional and amateur astronomers have been trying to discover for years now. But the only official confirmation was back in 2010 and since then nothing new has been found. Until of course now. And unfortunately other than the potential orbit that you see right here, we don't really know much else about this object. We know that it's obviously a relatively large asteroid, probably somewhat similar to the previously discovered Trojan which is around uh, 300 meters in diameter or approximately 1000 feet. And just like the previous discovery, it also has an orbit that essentially is a little bit more complex than just staying in that one spot. And so instead of just being in the Lagrange point, it actually moves in a really wide arc, even going as far as the orbit of Venus. Although, wait, it's on the other side, it's in the L4 point, which is the point preceding the orbit of Earth. And as you can see in this simulation, it even almost reaches the orbit of Mars. And in that sense, it's actually a really interesting object. Because first of all, all of this means that eventually either Venus or Mars will destabilize this orbit and so the object will probably move away, possibly escaping somewhere else or even becoming a Trojan of either Mars or Venus. But at the same time, now I guess the question would be, how can it stably orbit there to begin with? Shouldn't Venus already have disrupted it? And well, remember, this is a two-dimensional image. In reality, this object also has a really high inclination, meaning that it goes below and above the solar system plane, thus never really coming too close to Venus or Mars. And this is also one of the main reasons why it's somewhat difficult to find these objects. They move across the night skies quite a lot and quite unpredictably. While at the same time, they're usually in the location where the sun has a tendency to cover their presence. So it's very difficult to find these objects from planet Earth. And one of the best ways for us to try to find more of them would be to actually look at the orbit of planet Earth from another planet. Although obviously that's not something we can currently do just yet. And several other astronomers have already joined in and tried to simulate the stability of this object and turns out it's going to be in this relatively stable orbit for at least a few thousand years. And this is of course as stable as it gets for most of the Trojans orbiting smaller planets. Only Trojans of Jupiter for example or possibly Neptune would be able to stay in these orbits for much longer periods of time. So for example the first ever discovered Trojan is expected to stay in this orbit for probably about maximum 18,000 years before it gets captured by something else or possibly collides with something. And one of the main reasons why these objects normally do not have stable orbits for over a few thousand years is actually because of the pressure from the Sun, not so much the pressure from Jupiter's gravity. In this case, we're talking about something known as the Yarkovsky effect. The effect that starts appearing in any asteroid or any smaller object that spins around while orbiting the Sun 
That basically is explained by one side of the object being warmed up and as it spins around, that one side that's now warm emitting the radiation that can actually act as a tiny, tiny engine, kind of like a rocket engine, pushing the object away toward a certain direction. And this is a pretty powerful effect, especially for some of the medium-sized asteroids, to the point where sometimes we don't even know where a certain asteroid is going to be in the next few hundreds of years. There's actually a little bit more information about how this can be important for us and how it can actually lead to potentially dangerous collisions in one of the videos I made about the famous Apophis asteroid. The video is somewhere right there. But for the object, officially known as 2020 XL5, without an actual proper name just yet, it looks like the stability here is at least 4500 years. So definitely something that hypothetically at least we could one day explore. Although because these objects have such high inclination, or basically because their orbit is highly inclined to the rest of the solar system, it's somewhat difficult to get to them. For example, for this object right here, to try to reach this, you'd probably need just as much fuel as to reach Jupiter. So in that sense, even though they do share the orbit with planet Earth, because of their inclination, it is kind of difficult to get there. But in reality, once we find out how to find these objects more effectively, we could actually discover up to about a hundred of them. That's sort of the unofficial figure right now for how many we believe there should be out there orbiting in these L4, L5 Lagrange points. And before we forget, speaking of Trojans, NASA is officially launching a mission, the first ever mission to a Trojan in October of 2021. The mission known as Lucy. Obviously, we're going to be talking more about this in one of the future videos, but this is something to be aware of and something to actually, I guess in some sense, get excited about. Although by the time that the mission arrives to that Trojan, all of us are going to be much, much older. About seven years older, as a matter of fact. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing the mysterious signal known as BLC-1, also known as Breakthrough Listen-1, because this was the signal detected last year that suggested an artificial signal, radio signal, coming from the nearby Proxima Centauri system, the signal that possessed all of the properties the scientists expect from an, some sort of artificial signal coming from another star system. Or in other words, there was a slight chance that it was actually aliens talking to us. But this was a very preliminary discovery and a lot of scientists decided to err on the side of caution. So until now, nobody really knew what it was. And it looks like, once again, it wasn't aliens. But nevertheless, it's important to talk about this just so we know what to look for next time. So first of all, let's do a bit of a background history. The original detection happened back in 2019 when the Australian Parks Observatory was conducting its regular observations during the project known as Breakthrough Listen, the project whose main purpose is to actually try to locate some sort of a alien civilization trying to communicate with us. And then in December of 2020, this is when the original report suggested that something unusual was detected coming from the region in the vicinity of Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to us, that we know contains at least two planets. And so even though it wasn't really possible to detect the exact location where it came from, it seemed to suggest it possibly came from Proxima Centauri. Here's by the way what the signal sort of looked like, and interestingly it also seemed to contain what's known as Doppler shift, which is the frequency shift caused by an object that's moving, and the frequency of the Doppler shift seemed to correlate with the motion of Proxima Centauri which is why the scientists got so excited. And it also contained a lot of other so-called techno-signatures. So for example, the frequency here was almost exactly 982 megahertz. Although in the previous video that you should be able to find somewhere right there, I did explain that this frequency is often used in a lot of different devices here on planet Earth, which was kind of a hint that maybe this came from planet Earth after all. Nevertheless, there were quite a lot of other parameters that seemed to indicate that this could be a techno signature. So, for example, it only appeared when the scientists were looking at the direction of Proxima Centauri and disappeared when the telescope was looking somewhere else. It also occupied an extremely narrow band. The actual frequency was way too specific to be a natural source. This by itself already required a further investigation. Then, on top of this, over the period of about 5 hours, the signal also drifted. In other words, it suggested this was probably not coming from the surface of the planet. It was coming from outside of the planet, so somewhere from outer space. 
And because this signal lasted for several hours, this was unlikely to be a typical aircraft or even a typical satellite. As a matter of fact, there were several discussions on Twitter suggesting that there was no known satellite in this particular location at that particular time. Uh, unless I guess it was some sort of a secret satellite, which is always a possibility. But at the same time, there were still a lot of unanswered questions. For example, there were several flares detected around the same time coming from Proxima Centauri. So there was a suggestion that maybe this was related to the flares. At the same time, because of these flares, it's sort of to the belief that these planets are going to be extremely difficult to survive on, if not impossible. So at a distance of just over 4.2 light years away from us, even though this is a really exciting star system, it also is probably one of the most dangerous to live on. In other words, expecting life to survive on these planets at the moment is a bit of a stretch. Which is actually why Proxima Centauri, along with some other red dwarfs, are sometimes referred to as a flare star. They flare up so much that they release a tremendous amount of radiation. Nevertheless, it's the closest star, so this is probably the first object we'll ever get to visit if we get to visit anything at all. At the same time, it's kind of important to understand how this particular signal was originally discovered. The original analysis actually revealed approximately 4 million different signals, radio signals, from the same region. With essentially almost all of them completely ruled out as just natural signals coming from some sort of a natural source. And that's just to give you an idea of how many different signals can be detected coming from different areas. So these signals are not rare at all, they're very very common. But from these millions of signals, approximately 5000 looked kind of promising. These were the signals the scientists then referred to as the events. But once these events were filtered out manually, only a few remained with really only one of the signals making it through the entire analysis. In other words, this was the only signal that sort of appeared as a techno signature. Everything else ended up being either interference from planet Earth, or in some cases just something natural. And now, just under a year after the original announcement, and I guess about two years after the original discovery, the scientists have confirmed that this is once again not a techno signature, and not actually a signal coming from Proxima Centauri at all and is instead a type of a radio interference that they've managed to detect in a lot of other signals in a lot of other observations. And the way that the scientists discovered this is by going through a lot more data from the Parkes Observatory and by looking at a lot of other frequencies. Discovering several other signals that look somewhat similar, as you can see there's one very very dim one right here, with dozens of similar lookalikes or signals that possess very similar properties discovered in this data. Okay, but I guess the question is, could they all be techno signatures coming from Proxima Centauri? Well, the answer seems to be no, because a lot of these signals were not actually coming from this region at all. They were determined to be coming from off-source. In other words, they were detected from other telescopes or from other directions. And more importantly, a lot of them had the same frequencies we usually use for radio communication in, for example, different satellites. And interestingly, the spacing between the frequencies here would actually consistent with a typical clock oscillator that's often used for different types of radio communication here on Earth. Which means that a lot of these other signals very very likely came from Earth and not from some other planet somewhere out there. And this of course implies that BLC1 is very likely a similar signal in nature. It's just a radio interference signal produced by something earthly, not something from Proxima Centauri. But to be fair, currently there is really no one source that has been discovered that was responsible for BLC1. But the scientists in the paper do kind of make a prediction of what's possibly causing all of these. This is a phenomenon that's usually referred to as intermodulation, a phenomenon that often affects radio transmission, but it's also something that musicians are quite familiar with as well. You can learn more about intermodulation in the link in the description below, but in a nutshell, when the amplitude of several nearby frequencies is changed, it can occasionally start forming additional components that were actually not there to begin with. And so by mixing two different frequencies, these particular phenomena are often observed in a lot of radio communication. And so in this case, this could totally come from a satellite or possibly even nearby earthly source that was creating these intermodulation frequencies simply because of a certain interference in the amplifier that this radio communication device was using. And because so many of these lookalike signals, very similar to BLC1, were detected in this new data, it's only natural to assume that this is something that's really common, but something that we just didn't really know much about until now. 
And so, at the moment, it's almost definitively not a signal from Proxima Centauri. But I'm sure in some of the future studies, someone more familiar with how intermodulation works and someone more familiar with radio frequencies might even work out the exact source of the signal and find out what satellite or what device possibly caused this. At the moment, it's not really known. But BLC-1 is still a really, really interesting signal and it's a perfect case study for a lot of future detections that we're going to be making in the next few decades. And so even though we're obviously hoping to find some sort of uh, extraterrestrial species possibly sending radio signals to us, I guess at the moment it will be a little bit more exciting to actually discover where a lot of these lookalikes come from, which is of course really important to understand in order to avoid these mistakes in the future. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about fish. But as you can probably tell from the title, not just any fish, an extremely intelligent fish that seems to be able to communicate and seems to possess brain, or more specifically cerebellum, which you can see in blue here, that's extremely enlarged compared to a lot of other animals and a lot of other vertebrates, including humans. Which of course implies that this fish, by body mass, has more brain than human beings. But it's not this fish right here, it's not clownfish. And it's not a fish that a lot of us are familiar with, Unless, of course, fish and aquariums are your hobby. Something that I personally myself do not know much about. However, discovering the existence of this fish known as Mormirida, also known as freshwater elephant fish, with the elephant fish, of course, coming from the fact that all of these fish have these long protrusions uh, from their mouth, was a pretty big surprise, especially because I did not realize they were that intelligent or had such big brains. But more importantly, we're actually talking about one specific feature that a lot of these Mormiridas seem to possess. This feature being very complex communication. Communication that was recently identified and analyzed even more in one of the recent studies you can find in the description, that essentially suggests that these fish communicate extremely similar to humans and a lot of other really complex animals. They communicate using pauses and they seem to produce speech and patterns of speech not so different from what you would find in some other really complex animals such as dolphins, such as certain types of birds, and of course us. And these pauses suggest that there's a lot of really complex, I guess, sentences or complex pieces of information that are produced by these fish when they are in their natural environment. In other words, this is literally a talking fish, a fish that communicates with other fish and not just communicates with some simple signals or some simple chemical processes, it communicates using complex speech patterns. And so let's discuss a little bit more details about this unusual creature, what we know about it, and what we kind of think happened in their evolutionary history. Okay, so let's start right here. I think a lot of different cultures around the world, including Eastern European cultures, Asian cultures, and some German cultures, have the story of the talking fish. Usually it's a goldfish, but sometimes it's something entirely different. And in this case, the fish usually provides some sort of a wisdom to the human and possibly maybe make some promises. And I remember reading those stories when I was younger, and it always sort of fascinated me. But I think most of us kind of assumed that this was just a fairy tale, and not something that was actually possible. Because unlike other animals, most of us sort of assume that fish, for the most part, are not particularly smart. In other words, attributing intelligence to fish is not something we kind of naturally do. But because there are so many different fish out there and because there are a lot of possibilities for developing intelligence in various species, it's only natural to make an assumption that somewhere out there, there's going to be at least one fish that develops complex intelligence and of course, complex communication skills. Which would of course make sense because, for example, there are a lot of birds that are not particularly smart, but there are also birds that are absolute geniuses. And so you would expect something similar to happen to fish. But what exactly happened and how did it happen? Well, the scientists for the past few years have been trying to figure out why certain type of Mormirida possessed larger brains than usual. And of 200 species of Mormirida, this one right here, the average looking Gnathonamus petersai, also known as Peter's alpha nose fish, by body mass ratio seems to possess the largest brain of all vertebrates bigger than humans, and that implies only one thing. Well, maybe two things. It implies that there's a lot of intelligence going on inside these fish, especially because their cerebellum seems to be much bigger than some of the other specimen, and it also implies that these unusual fish require a tremendous amount of energy and a tremendous amount of oxygen in order to have those brains operate 
at optimum performance levels. Which of course means that they can probably only survive in oxygen-rich areas of different rivers, and they also have to very likely consume a lot of high-energy food. And interestingly, just like with mammals, specifically with humans and with a lot of apes, as the brains of these fish increased in size, the guts and the intestines of these fish decreased in size, allowing the body to conserve more energy. And this implies that they probably only survive on extremely nutritious food. In case of humans, we basically learn how to cook and how to extract nutrition from various uh, food products. But in case of these fish, well, they seem to live in areas where a lot of highly nutritious worms, for example, usually hide in very murky waters. And it's the life in these murky conditions where it's extremely difficult for the fish to see that sort of allow them to evolve what they have today, their large brains. Because they lived in conditions where it was extremely dark and very, very difficult to see anything with eyes, over time they evolved the ability to communicate using electricity. Here's sort of what their body looks like. They possess a lot of different electroreceptors all over the body, with a lot of them present inside their mouth-like formations. And they also have their own electric organ that generates electricity using an electrocyte, which is a cell that uh, was originally a muscle cell, but eventually learned how to produce electricity. And generally they produce electricity in the frequency of about 500 hertz. But unlike some other fish that usually use this to maybe catch prey by electrifying them or use electricity in self-defense, these unusual fish instead use this directly to communicate with one another. And it's very likely that this communication method only developed because of the murky conditions where they live. Mostly because it's so difficult for them to see anything, over time they adapted to use this electrocommunication for various needs and for various types of communication. But because of the ability to communicate using electro signals, this then led their brains to develop over time, with some of these mermorida having relatively small cerebellum, but other ones developing a huge cerebellum in comparison, as their communication complexity increased and as they started to produce various types of, well, fish speech, or fish language, or whatever you want to call it. And they seem to use this communication for a lot of different things. For example, it was already discovered that certain signals are used to identify mates or identifying specific individuals that they're next to and also for providing information about the sex of the actual fish. Is this a male fish or a female fish? Although interestingly enough, apparently people that have these fish in different fish tanks are usually unable to identify their gender unless they use some sort of an electrode to try to listen to their electrocommunication and in that case it becomes possible to see if it's a male or a female. However, inside a typical fish tank or an aquarium, some of these fish tend to develop different electric impulses and sometimes even reverse their sexual signals, which means that their partners are unable to differentiate between different genders anymore and it becomes very difficult for these fish to reproduce if they live in artificial conditions inside a fish tank. But it seems that prior to the development of this complex brain and complex communication, this particular species was not really that successful. And it was only after the development of this ability to communicate and to use these electrical signals that this unusual fish exploded in its evolution and became one of the most widespread fish in fresh waters of Africa. And Africa is really the only continent where you can currently find them in their natural habitat. And a lot of these recent studies discovered some really, really cool things about their communication. And remember, this is just using those electrical signals. For example, they tend to use various types of echoes, kind of similar to dolphins and, I guess, bats, to both locate themselves and also to provide information to other fish. They also tend to exhibit something that we usually refer to as word recognition, when a listener usually stops talking and starts listening, waiting for a certain meaning of a certain word. They do so by essentially pausing their own electrical signals and resuming their electrical activity once the first speaker finished talking. Also interestingly, when putting a lot of these fish in the same fish tank or in the same environment, some of them will stop producing electrical signals completely. Especially when one of the fish is extremely active in its electrical stimulation. And in this particular case, it resembles one person talking and other fish listening. At the same time, by placing a fish alone in a fish tank, the scientists realized that it was producing a lot less electrical signals and was almost not producing any pauses at all. It's as if that fish was kind of mumbling to itself and not really listening to anyone anymore. 
but by placing two fish, they were able to see that one of the fish would always pause when the other fish was talking. And so in this case, it really demonstrated that the best animal communication or the best type of fish communication in this case always resulted in some sort of a silence from one fish or the other. But more importantly, they also noticed that when one of these fish needed to communicate a lot of information all at the same time, it would always take a long pause beforehand, as if preparing all of its listeners that were about to receive a lot of really important advice. Surprisingly, they identified that the actual time scale for these pauses were extremely similar to human speech as well. Which of course to the scientists in the study implied that similar cellular processes must be happening inside the brains of these fish to what happens inside our brains as well. And so a pause of about one second would sort of prime their partner or their listener to suddenly receive a lot of important information. But this is not unique to humans and these fish. This also seems to happen in a lot of birds. This also seems to happen in many different mammals. And even frogs, certain types of frogs, experience these pauses and this type of communication as well. Which of course does not imply that these fish are the smartest animals on the planet. They're still probably really smart and they probably still are going to surprise us with some other discoveries. But I wouldn't really expect them to solve any calculus anytime soon. As a matter of fact, except for this complex communication, they do not seem to possess a lot of other intelligence typical of some other intelligent animals, such as for example tool use. Nevertheless, this still makes this fish one of the most interesting, most fascinating and most mysterious vertebrates on the planet. A strange fish that seems to have evolved very complex communication skills which then led to its evolutionary success in certain regions of Africa. And because these fish vary in size and complexity, similar to how, for example, monkeys and apes are different, with the smallest fish being about 5 centimeters in size and the largest being about 1.5 meters, or roughly around 5 feet, this by itself does show how successful this particular species has become simply because of that one skill of complex communication. But obviously we're not going to be able to interpret what they're saying anytime soon and we're probably not going to be discovering a way to talk to them either. All of this is right now beyond our capabilities. Also chances are they are not really saying anything super smart either. But there's one thing I wanted to mention before I finish this video. And it's the fact that because of this complexity and because of their brain right now, Evolutionary speaking, these fish do have a lot of problems coming in the future. Specifically because their brains require way more oxygen than even our brains. About 60% of the entire oxygen consumption in this fish goes to its brain. And this actually means that these fish require very specific conditions to survive. And since they only live in fresh waters of Africa, it's extremely easy for these fish to lose their habitat and thus become extinct. And so in that sense, because of their complexity and because of this very specific adaptation, they also have a much higher chance of going extinct if suddenly all of the waters or much of the water in Africa suddenly becomes either less oxygenated or stops producing nutritious materials they need to survive. Which means that they do have a chance to go extinct if the conditions in those waters suddenly change. Their brains are just not going to be able to survive if the oxygen levels are much lower. But at the moment it's not really a problem, it's just something that theoretically could happen. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton. And well, this right here is one of the biggest papers when it comes to human biology released in the last few decades. And as you can probably tell from the title here, it looks like the scientists have finally completed mapping the entire human genome. Something that I guess some of us thought was done a long time ago, but turns out wasn't at all. As a matter of fact, 8% of the genome was still missing. And so this is a really, really important achievement, especially when it comes to understanding who we are. But let's talk a little bit more about this in a little bit more detail. So first of all, the original genome project or the human genome project was started back in the 90s and it was going on for almost a decade and the first official release was completed back in 2004. And to date, this is the biggest scientific biological collaboration between various countries, various organizations and various institutions working together trying to map the human genome. And back then, it was really, really expensive. The approximate cost was about $300 million. Apparently today, if we were to try to do the same using very similar technologies, it would actually cost us close to about $300. So the costs have dramatically dropped since then. 
But even though in 2004, or actually 2003, the scientists announced that the genome project was technically complete, there were still some gaps in the knowledge of the human genome, and specifically about 8% was still unknown. But because it was highly repetitive parts of the genome, with certain parts just being an extremely repetitive part of the DNA that didn't really produce anything, back then the scientists were more than satisfied with this result. And even to date, the Human Genome Project is really the first time we've actually mapped the entire genome code of a vertebrate to near perfection. And as of just a few years ago, over a million different people have contributed to the project by basically contributing their blood or contributing their genetic code in order to produce this particular project. So in other words, it's not actually built from the DNA of one person, it's really more of a kind of a mosaic where lots of different pieces from lots of different people were taken together and then combined into a single code. But unfortunately, a full and entire chromosome has never actually been sequenced up until this point. And especially those missing regions were never really mapped by anyone. And mostly because, well, the technology was just not there yet. The previously used technology was only really good for those smaller chunks. And it took two decades of innovation and two major companies with two newly invented trademarked technologies to allow for more precise mapping and, obviously, more precise analysis of the human genome. One of these technologies uses lasers and shines the lasers onto the genetic code and thus produces the reading of various sequences in the code, whereas the other found a way to run the entire chromosome through a tiny, tiny hole where each of these single pairs is individually analyzed and read out. Although naturally these are new technologies and that they're also extremely expensive. But sometime last year in 2020, a few scientists behind the consortium known as T2T or telomere to telomere proposed and published a paper suggesting that it was probably possible to map the human genome completely, even those missing gaps, by using these new technologies and decided to try this themselves while also making everything publicly available on GitHub, which you can explore yourself by using the link below. And it looks like everything was completed. The entire genome, pretty much everything including those missing parts, was finally mapped and we now have a full picture of everything inside our genes. Which means that the genome project is finally officially finished. We have the complete human genome that's publicly available for anyone studying genomics. But I guess the question is, so what exactly was missing from the original publication and what exactly was discovered now? Well, those 8%, those repetitive genes, are mostly inside these parts known as centromeres, which is this part you see in red located right in the middle of the X chromosome. Now, these structures generally play a very, very large role in directing the chromosomes, especially during replication, but they also connect things together. Although they do have many other roles, and there's also different types of centromeres out there. So it is a lot more complex than just being some sort of a holding mechanism. It's actually a lot more than that. But it was extremely difficult for scientists to try to map all of this and to try to fill in the gaps of the missing data from some of the previous studies. And so by combining the old technology with some of the new technologies, the scientists were finally able to build a picture of what the human genome seems to contain and what it seems to look like. Or in other words, they were able to establish the specific base pairs that establish the genome in general. Now obviously for every different person it's going to be different, and some people might have some genes and not other genes, but by sequencing the DNA of several individuals and then essentially combining it into one genome, we still get a general impression of what sort of genes normally humans have while also establishing the regions in the DNA that are either non-coding, mysterious, or repetitive. And there's actually a lot of those regions in the DNA, with the part of the DNA that actually produces proteins being only about 1.5% of the entire chromosome, with the rest being, well, a lot of other things. Things like non-coding RNA, regulatory DNA sequences, something referred to as line, sign, introns, and a lot of other sequences that we are not even sure what they're there for. And this of course includes a lot of other topics I've previously discussed on the channel, such as various types of viruses that are part of our DNA as well. But the new study and the new calculations suggested that we underestimated the total number of base pairs. The total number increased by about 4.5%, with the total number of base pairs in a typical human chromosome equivalent to about 3.05 billion different base pairs which, if printed, would create a really large book. 
which in some sense you can kind of think of as these connections here, except that certain base pairs form three connections, in this case CG, whereas AT forms two connections. And so there are literally 3.05 billion of these. But of all of these billions and billions of base pairs, they only produce exactly 19,969 proteins. That's according to the recent study. This number could obviously change uh, with some of the new studies and also maybe certain proteins are still not very well understood, but in a nutshell, this is kind of what we think now. 3 billion base pairs that end up creating you and me. But this of course does not help us at all in trying to figure out what exactly those missing regions were, the 8% that could not be analyzed before, or more specifically what exactly their function is. When it comes to understanding the function and of course the presence of those other regions in the human genome, it's literally like the dark matter of the universe. Nobody really understands what exactly it is just yet, but there's a lot of it in the DNA. Also, this particular analysis and a lot of these studies are based on a somewhat limiting factor. They did not actually use, for ethical reasons, a genome or a DNA molecule from a normal person, from a human. What they actually used is a genetic code from a somewhat rare problem with pregnancy. It's known as the Moore pregnancy, with this picture right here showing exactly what they used. This is a hydatidiform mole a very strange and very unusual cellular formation that results when a sperm ends up fertilizing an egg that does not have a nucleus. So it actually produces a somewhat similar to human genome, but it is not an actual human cell and it's not a human being. It ends up just being a kind of a mole growth that ends up being removed or just eventually naturally disappears. And so by extracting those cells from these particular unusual cells, which technically still have the human um, code in them, the scientists in this paper were able to, quite ethically, produce a human genome without actually using a human being, a living being. Although I guess it's not entirely clear if there was a possibility for maybe some unusual mutations or some other changes that these cells go through compared to an actual human being, compared to a real human. So this is of course something that can be investigated in some of the future studies. And also because a lot of these cells were stored in the freezer and also most likely aged a little bit, it's not entirely clear if the results were accurate because maybe the cells were also a little bit degraded. But once again, this is something that can be established in future studies. For now, what's important is that they were able to produce an entire 100% telomere to telomere code of an entire chromosome from a human cell. Not from a human being, but from a human cell. And all of this is now freely available on GitHub. However, this is just the code. It still does not explain the function of a lot of these sequences and a lot of these unusual elements that were missing from some of the previous reports. And so there's still, of course, quite a lot to discover, quite a lot to analyze, and quite a lot to learn about what exactly is it that makes us. But also, more importantly, what are those extra parts, which represent about 98.5% of the entire genome? And so all of these questions will hopefully be answered in the next few decades or so. For now, well, it is still a big mystery, but we're definitely getting closer and closer to figuring everything out. Once in a while, we discover something absolutely incredible in our own solar system. And today is that day. Hello, wonderful person. Today we're going to be talking about a discovery of a very unusual and somewhat mysterious object that the scientists believe to be possibly a dwarf planet coming all the way from the Oort cloud with an average orbit of about 4 million years. And it was just detected on the approach to the inner solar system. And in approximately 10 years from now, its closest approach is going to take it all the way to the orbit of Saturn. But because of the sheer size of this object, it makes it the largest comet in the inner solar system in the last few hundreds of years. Although it's not really clear if it's going to be easily visible like some of the other comets we've recently seen. What is however clear is that this is an object coming from really really far away in the outer regions of the solar system and might create an excellent opportunity for us to study some of these objects from the Oort cloud. The cloud that goes way, way beyond the Kuiper's belt and beyond the orbit of Pluto and essentially represents the outer edges of the solar system, something that's ridiculously far away, to some extent representing the gravitational limit where our Sun can still sort of hold on to some of these objects, and anything past that is technically interstellar space. But first of all, how exactly was this found? Well, it turns out that the images of this object were originally taken back in 2014, 
but they weren't really seen and analyzed until relatively recently. All of this was part of the Dark Energy Survey, also known as DES, that's already been able to produce a lot of really interesting discoveries. But I guess this new discovery was really unexpected. Now originally all of this was reported right here in the Minor Planet Center, and it was actually a report of an unusual object detected in the Dark Energy Survey data. A report that I later read on this Minor Planet mailing list where a citizen astronomer by the name of Sam Dean was quick enough to explain exactly what the scientists discovered. And by analyzing the trajectory of this object, the scientists have already worked out exactly where it's going to pass in the solar system and how long it's going to take to reach the farthest part of its orbit, with the closest approach that's going to be just past the orbit of Saturn taking place sometime in 2031. And by the way, it took this object about 3 million years to reach this point, which of course means that it spent most of its time far, far away from the center of the solar system and also very likely has never really been exposed to much sunlight, which also is already quite evident because it became a comet even far away from the sun itself. It's currently at a distance of about 22 astronomical units um, away from the sun, which is already closer than Neptune, but even here it's already started to exhibit a little bit of a cometary tail, which is of course one of the reasons why it was uh, discovered by the scientists. And in the last seven years, since the first images are taken in 2014, it already managed to travel seven astronomical units. And since it already developed this cometary tail at these distances, it implies that it contains a lot of extreme volatiles. Kind of similar to this other comet that came from a really far away distance, and was analyzed approximately two years ago back in 2019. This one here contained a lot of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which emitted a really large tail really far away from the solar system. And this of course implies that this is, once again, what's known as very pristine material. Material that has been untouched by pretty much anything for possibly billions of years and very likely represents some of the most natural and most scientifically curious types of ices that have ever been seen so close to the sun. Although unfortunately, currently the scientists believe that even when it comes really close to the sun, it's not going to create an extremely bright tail unlike some of the other comets. It's going to be visible using uh, scientific instruments, but not really as easily visible using some of the telescopes you might have lying around at home. Although we don't really know, and chances are it might still change its luminosity in approximately 10 years. But what makes this object particularly interesting now is not really the fact that it's a comet or that it's going to pass really close to Saturn. What makes it interesting is its orbit and of course the fact that it's so big. It's possibly about 300 kilometers in diameter, and that makes it almost a dwarf planet, possibly even a dwarf planet, depending on what it contains on the inside. As a matter of fact, it has a very high chance of being somewhat spherical, which of course would make it a dwarf planet by definition. But in this case, it's a very unique dwarf planet. It's coming from really far away reaches of space. It also seems to be really dark. It's only about 1 to possibly 8% reflective, which is somewhat dark for these objects. With the surface maybe resembling something similar to what we see on Pluto, the darker patches here, that do contain a lot of tollings and a lot of other compounds that sort of make it really dark. But the other intriguing part about this object is of course how eccentric the orbit is. It's like 99.99% eccentric meaning that there was always a chance some star could have stolen this object from the solar system, or there is maybe a chance that our sun stole this object from some other star system that passed close to us. So in other words, there is a lot of opportunity for us to do some really good science here, assuming that a mission to this object happens in the next few years. And the thing is, after 2031, it's going to once again go all the way to the farthest reaches of the solar system, and specifically at a distance of about 50,000 astronomical units away from the sun. And it might technically never really come back from there. We know that in the next few million years, another star is going to come really close to the sun, and it might dislodge this object from its current orbit, thus sending it to interstellar space. But the outbound orbit is assumed to be roughly around four and a half million years, meaning that if it ever comes back to the inner solar system, it's going to be in the next four and a half million years from now. And so we definitely cannot miss this opportunity, and I think uh, NASA or some other agencies need to start planning a mission here soon. Currently, it's not even known what sort of an object this is. Technically, it's a comet. It could be a dwarf planet, but it could be a completely new type of an object as well. As a matter of fact, some of the scientists have compared this to one of the previous comets from about 300 years ago, from 1729. 
the comet of 1729 was allegedly the largest object, the largest cometary object that ever approached the solar system. It might have been one of the brightest, if not the brightest comets ever seen. Apparently it had like six tails and was also in an extremely eccentric orbit and possibly has completely left the solar system by now as well. And because of this, comets like this are extremely interesting both for science and also for general public. These events are extremely rare. Although in terms of the size of objects in the inner solar system, it's obviously not the largest object that experiences the cometary activity. There are a few other objects like the centaurs of Jupiter and this one specifically known as Chiron that do this once in a while as well. Chiron is about 212 kilometers in diameter and once in a while it starts being a comet as well. If I zoom out of here, you'll see that it does have a cometary tail right now as well. But Chiron has been in the inner solar system for an extremely long time. And though NASA obviously hopes to study it one day, it's maybe not as interesting as C2014 UN271, the object that doesn't really have a cool name just yet. But there's actually another important reason to try to possibly launch a mission here and to try to study this in more detail. This is in regards to a recent study that analyzed and tried to recreate the Oort cloud by using a variety of different simulations. And what the scientists discovered here is that, for the most part, the objects in the Oort cloud seem to have at least three different origins. The first obvious origin is what you see right here. They got kicked out as they interacted with various planets such as Jupiter and Saturn in the beginning of the solar system. Others were probably just the leftovers of the original protoplanetary disk from which the solar system was made approximately four and a half billion years ago. But the third origin of these objects is what makes them so exciting. A lot of them very likely came from other star systems which means that they were captured by our sun as it passed close to some of the other stars in the past. And this is probably especially true of the objects that are really far away from the sun in the beginning, including possibly this object as well. There is a slight chance that it possibly came from another star system and is either much older or much younger and thus could contain completely different components on the inside and present a super interesting opportunity for us to study these objects. Now, obviously, the chance that this is an interstellar object is pretty slim, but it's still there. And the fact that it's a large object and it's already emitting a lot of materials means that this is a pristine object that has not really experienced a lot of starlight before. Although, unfortunately, because of the distances involved and also because this would be a pretty expensive mission, chances of it actually happening right now are pretty slim. Unless the scientists start planning this mission and are somehow able to launch it in the next couple of years, it's going to be extremely difficult to catch up with this comet, or this possible dwarf planet, or this interstellar visitor, whatever you want to call it. We're not going to know what it is for a few months at least. Either way, this is definitely one of the most exciting discoveries of the recent times, and it's probably going to create a lot of excitement and a lot of new studies in the next few months as well. Although personally, I'm really hoping for an actual mission, because this would be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and well, let's just jump right into it. This tiny green dot you see right here, that's essentially the first ever potential candidate for the existence of Planet 9, the hypothetical ninth planet located somewhere in the solar system. But because there is so much more to the story and because this is not actually even that certain just yet, I wanted to discuss this in more detail, starting with the study itself and the single scientist who was able to discover all of this, Michael Rowan Robinson, whose study, as always, you can find in the description below. And so let's talk a little bit more about what exactly he did compared to some of the other scientists and why he was able to find this one candidate while no one else could and also discuss the possibility of this actually being that planet we're looking for, or if it's just another object that's going to be identified as something entirely different. And let's begin with the Planet 9 itself. So by now you're probably familiar with the story already, but just to give you a brief overview, a few years ago several scientists started to discover the distant objects that we often refer to as TNOs, also known as trans-Neptunian objects. Around this time, this is when Pluto was officially demoted from being a planet to being what's known as a dwarf planet. And so quite a lot of these objects started to be discovered and a few of them seemed to possess very unusual orbits with very specific inclinations that would be difficult to explain unless something was pulling at them from a somewhat distant region in the solar system. 
mostly because they were far enough not to be affected by anything, including Neptune, and so these unusual orbits were kind of difficult to explain at first. And because of the relative similarity of their tilt, several scientists independently proposed that maybe there's actually some sort of a hidden object, such as the ninth planet. And maybe this particular planet is pulling at these objects just enough to create these visible changes in their orbit. But this was based on the observation of just a few of these objects. Since then, in the last uh, 6 or 7 years, a lot more of these TNOs have been discovered, and some of the orbits did not actually match anything. As a matter of fact, several other explanations have been proposed, including the potential gravitational effects from pretty much the entire region that we refer to as the Oort Cloud, and the potential scientific bias when it comes to observing these specific TNOs. As a matter of fact, one of the best explanations was described in one of the videos before, and that was basically that maybe we're just biased at when we're looking for these objects, and where exactly we're finding them. In other words, the existence of Planet 9 started to be kind of questioned, and so many scientists were still quite divided about its existence. On the one hand, we expect there to be some sort of a, another planet based on the simulations of the formation of the solar system, but on the other hand, um, well, some of the previous surveys, specifically infrared surveys, did not really discover anything. Or at least anything big and warm enough. A smaller object could still exist somewhere, but we're just probably not seeing it. And there was even an eccentric proposition that maybe all of these observations are caused by some sort of a primordial black hole that's just invisible to us. Now that was an explanation that was sort of far-fetched, but it was scientifically valid in the sense that we know that primordial black holes can definitely exist, and assuming that something is gravitationally pulling at these objects, well, maybe it's a black hole. And so there were definitely a lot of different propositions to try to explain all of these unusual observations in the orbital parameters. And so assuming that such a planet does exist, well, where would it be located and what sort of a planet would it be? Well, the initial proposition was that it was anywhere between 5 and 10 masses of planet Earth, and it was probably about 400 to 800 astronomical units away from the Sun. So basically it would be a Neptune-like world, very very cold Neptune-like world, and it would be really really far, way past the orbit of Pluto. But because nothing was really being detected with these particular parameters, the scientists had to rework some of their initial assumptions. The most recent assumption is that, well, it's probably about half as far, maybe between about 380 and 460 AU. And the mass of the planet could also be a little bit smaller, possibly 5 masses of planet Earth, or even less. But the two major infrared surveys that are usually really really good at detecting these objects, or even detecting small comets, and so here we're talking about the WISE survey and the PAN stars, did not discover anything in any of their data. Or to be more exact, they ruled out anything that's the size of Neptune or in that vicinity. So nothing that would be about 8 to 10 masses of planet Earth seems to exist anywhere in the solar system except for, of course, inner solar system. Although the thing is, these surveys did not cover the entire night skies. Some of the other patches had to be covered by some other telescopes. One such telescope is the 8 meter Subaru telescope located in Hawaii. But once again, as of to date, nothing was discovered by any of these telescopes. And without an actual visual observation of Planet 9, its existence is, well, it's very hypothetical, and it's basically just an assumption, a big assumption. As a matter of fact, making the announcement so quickly about this planet unfortunately gave science a little bit of a bad credibility, at least in my opinion. Nevertheless, it did kickstart a tremendous search of the night skies, which allowed the scientists in the last few years to discover a lot of super super cool things we've discussed on the channel already. Now, there is actually one telescope that everyone's looking forward to, the Vera Rubin telescope, that's definitively going to be able to search the entire night skies and identify every single hidden object in there. But that telescope is still a few years away from being operational and from being able to conduct such a search. Okay, but then how exactly did this person discover something? Well, he did something entirely different, something really really smart. He looked at an extremely old data from one of the first surveys, infrared surveys, of the entire night skies. Or basically the granddaddy of all infrared surveys, IRAS, Infrared Astronomical Satellite. And this was a survey conducted nearly 40 years ago, 1983. It lasted for just under one year, but collected quite a lot of data. And what's really really cool about this telescope is that, well, it seemed to have been extremely good at detecting a lot of infrared things that at first made no sense to anyone. 
For example, during its operation, it detected several sources of infrared radiation coming from several stars. But when the scientists used Hubble telescope or a lot of more powerful telescopes to look at those stars, they found nothing. So initially, this was assumed to be some sort of a mistake and possibly just something wrong with the telescope. Turns out, it was seeing something. It was actually detecting infrared signatures from various protoplanetary disks. And this was not discovered until 2014 using some of the most powerful telescopes out there. So it was basically detecting this. And it was doing so 30 years before it was officially discovered by, for example, Spitzer telescope and modern version of the Hubble telescope. It then also discovered some other mysterious infrared signatures, which in the beginning did not make any sense. Later on, the scientists realized that what they were looking at is this, the so-called infrared cirrus, or these galactic filaments that basically form these very, very large infrared clouds and that seem to be present in many regions of the galaxy. And some other infrared points turned out to be very distant galaxies, something that was also not seen by any previous telescopes until then. Although interestingly, back in the days, back in 1983, one of the biggest headlines was actually in regards to a potential detection of some kind of an object in the solar system. Maybe a planet, maybe something else. But this is really important because it turned out to be not in a solar system at all. Because it's kind of difficult to measure distances in space, this turned out to be extremely far away and was actually once again one of these serious clouds. And so there was at least one case when it was basically a mistaken identity. But nevertheless, this telescope was able to discover over 250,000 different objects in the night skies and many of them have not really been classified even today. And so for this particular study, Michael Rowan Robinson decided to go with the survey, decided to use the data from here, and specifically focused on trying to figure out what would hypothetical Planet 9 look like if it were to appear in this survey. In other words, what sort of a point would it represent? Would it be a large point? Would it have certain other parameters? And well, by making this assumption, he decided to go through the entire survey and see if he can actually discover anything that matches these particular observations. With the planet itself very likely just being a single dot somewhere in the survey itself. But a dot that would be unidentified and that would be probably traveling in a somewhat eccentric orbit. Now, pretty much most of the objects in the survey are either asteroids, galaxies, or different cirrus clouds. So for the most part, all of the points he discovered suggested that it was something that was already known or something that was not a planet at all. But this was under the assumption that the planet would be slightly larger, anywhere from maybe 5 to 10 masses of planet Earth, and that it would be 400 to 800 AU away from the Sun. And with these particular parameters, nothing was discovered in these regions of the solar system. This is, of course, including the entire night skies. But what if we lower the mass of the potential planet 9 and move it a little bit closer to the Sun? So here, something that's maybe less than 5 masses of planet Earth at a total distance of anywhere from 200 to 400 AU. Now, first of all, at this point, the object would be slightly larger. It would be maybe 2 or even 3 points. And because this object would be moving across the night skies, it would also have a specific separation between the first detection and the last detection. And using these parameters, several hundred different points have been identified in the survey, but the majority, once again, were not really planets, but once again were either galaxies, different clouds, or a lot of different comets and asteroids. Except for this one point right here. There was one single candidate that seemed to fit right into the description of what the scientist was looking for. And here the distance would be about 225 AU and the total mass of this object would be anywhere from 3 to 5 masses of planet Earth. But remember, super preliminary discovery. There is a really really high chance that this is actually something entirely different. And this is exactly what the scientist concludes his paper with. But I guess the question is, why was it not seen before? And how exactly can we prove this uh, object and its existence? Well, the main reason it was not seen in previous surveys is because of its relatively high location in the night skies. As in, it has a relatively high ecliptic latitude, while at the same time having a low galactic latitude. And many of the previous surveys just didn't really look in this region. The author also admits that because the telescope is relatively old, and this is basically one of the first technologies using this, the data here is not of the highest quality, so additional observations are needed to see if this is really there. He also provides the overall orbital calculations, suggesting where we can possibly detect it today. While at the same time, additional observations using other frequencies is also needed to see what's happening here. 
for example using radio telescopes, using optical telescopes, and using a lot of other observations to determine exactly what this object is and what exactly was discovered in the survey. So for example, if it's discovered that this is a stationary object and it hasn't moved at all in the last, what is it, like 38 years? Well, this would mean that it's not an object in the solar system at all. It's probably once again some sort of a distant infrared object that created an unusually similar appearance to a planet in the solar system. However, if this object moved across the night skies as predicted here, and if it's also detected by some of the other surveys, for example optical telescopes or radio telescopes, well then we're onto something for sure. Which means that, well, we now need to wait for follow-ups, for additional observations, and the potentially groundbreaking news about maybe discovering a new planet in the solar system. But until this is either confirmed or denied, once again, an extremely preliminary discovery. An exciting discovery, but still very, very preliminary. There is a really interesting experiment going on in Italy that's been trying to discover the mysterious dark matter for a few years now. And last year we've discussed one of the major announcements from this experiment that potentially identified something unexplainable. But a very recent analysis and a very recent paper, reanalyzing a lot of this data, discovered something a little bit more interesting, a little bit more intriguing, and potentially a little bit more groundbreaking. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this particular study that suggests we might have actually discovered dark energy. The concept that we kind of know even less about. So let's discuss this in more detail and talk about some of the potential discoveries coming out of the study. First of all, quick reminder, and I guess quick clarification. Dark matter, despite its somewhat unusual name, does not necessarily mean that it's some sort of a particle. It's more of a phenomenon. An unexplained phenomenon that seems to cause a lot of matter in the universe to sort of stick together a little bit more and to cause certain increases in mass where there should be none. We've discussed this idea a lot before and I've also discussed a lot of the proofs behind this, but at the moment nobody really knows what's causing all of these effects. And so in reality, instead of calling it dark matter, we should be calling it some sort of a gravitational anomaly or some sort of a mass anomaly. It does not necessarily mean it's made out of particles, but one of the most leading theories, and I guess some of the best explanations in regards to dark matter, do propose that it might contain some sort of a particle. Specifically, there are two major theories, either particles known as WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, or another concept known as axions, both of which theoretically make sense, but neither one of which has so far been detected. Although interestingly enough, last year we've discussed this unusual detection from the experiment known as Xenon-1T. The experiment you can learn more about from one of the links in the description. In a nutshell, just like some of the previous experiments with a similar name, most of these experiments usually involve some sort of a really large tank filled with liquid xenon. With xenon being that uh, noble gas that doesn't really react with much and generally does not produce a lot of emissions. And so if something passes through this gas, and specifically here we're talking about some sort of a dark matter particle, in theory it should create some sort of an emission. And so a lot of these tanks will also often contain some of the most advanced sensors in the world. Here's actually the image from this particular experiment with each of these sensors being able to quite accurately detect and position every single particle that interacts with that particular tank of xenon. And to make sure that there's an actual detection and that it's not some sort of an error, normally the scientists first run the experiment by trying to measure the background radiation and then use these measurements as a kind of a baseline in order to detect any potential extra particles then hitting the tank. And so it just so happens that the data released from last year, with the data itself representing the collection for approximately two years between 2016 and 2018, detected 53 extra events on top of the 232 background radiation events that were expected from this particular experiment, which presented a lot of interesting opportunities to study and to try to figure out what exactly it is that the scientists have discovered. But in order to analyze the actual interaction of particles with the tank of xenon, the scientists had to rely on the mathematical models, mostly because, well, the only data they have from all of these detections is the amount of energy that's being produced by every single particle interacting with xenon. And so if the mathematical model for, for example, dark matter axions matches the observations, in this case it would mean that we've finally detected dark matter. 
But unfortunately, the original predictions or the original analysis determined that it's very, very unlikely for these particular particles, these 53 extra detections, to be axions or to be any kind of a dark matter particle that we originally predicted. Mostly because, well, there were just too many. We would require a lot more of these axions everywhere in the universe for this amount of extra detections to be then discovered here on planet Earth. Or in other words, we would just require way, way more dark matter everywhere. And that doesn't exactly match with the theory and the original prediction. And so a potentially different explanation was required to explain these 53 extra detections, which is what the scientists have been trying to do for the past year and a half now. They've been trying to figure out what exactly can be used to explain. And so the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description below constructed an entirely new model in order to try to explain the observations, and their physical model seems to fit almost perfectly. But strangely enough, their model does not focus on dark matter at all. It focuses on that other, even less understood concept, dark energy. Alright, so what exactly is that? Well, it's that other concept we know so little about. I think in the past I've probably made about three to maybe four videos in the last few years, and that's how little we know about dark energy. It's that stuff that we believe exists everywhere in the universe, and it's that stuff that seems to encourage and increase the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, but we don't really understand what's causing it and how exactly any of this works. We only know about this mathematically. It seems to represent approximately 68% of everything in the universe, with approximately 27% being the mysterious dark matter, and everything else being the stuff we're familiar with, the things we're made out of. But whatever dark energy is, it does seem to be an actual phenomenon as well. It seems to somehow accelerate the expansion of the universe, something that has been proven over and over again using different experiments. There's actually at least one major experiment trying to figure this out, known as the Dark Energy Survey. Ironically though, instead of discovering more about dark energy, in the past, this experiment has allowed us to discover some of the least visible objects in our own uh, solar system and also in the vicinity in our own galaxy. We still haven't really learned much about dark energy itself from this particular experiment. And generally, the way that these experiments work is by trying to look really, really far away into outer space in order to measure the actual speed of the expansion of the universe. And by doing this, we're hoping to understand what exactly is causing this and what exactly is going on. But in terms of the actual explanations for, I guess, a potential particle or whatever else is causing all of this, there are just not a lot of explanations. For example, in most astrophysics textbooks, or I guess even most scientists today, will actually say that it's just part of the equation, it's just part of mathematics. Nothing is causing this except for the universe itself. But this particular explanation does not really satisfy everyone. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest and to some extent uh, most well accepted explanations, something you can read about in some of the papers in the description below, is this unusual particle that the scientists refer to as the chameleon particle. And it's called chameleon because of its ability to sort of blend in to various types of environments. Or to be more exact, they're sort of able to change their mass and even probably other properties based on the amount of mass present around them, based on the total density. And so if they're located inside a high density area, such as for example inside some sort of a planet, even though their mass is going to become really large, they're not going to be producing a lot of force. They're only going to be pulling things apart at a really, really small radius of about one millimeter. Yet, if these particles reach uh, low density areas, so basically somewhere in between galaxies, somewhere in between galactic clusters, their mass will suddenly decrease dramatically, but at the same time they suddenly acquire an ability to influence objects really, really, really far away. Which basically means that they change depending on the location where you find them. And so to try to explain this, the scientists once again focused on the Sun. But in this case, a specific area of the Sun known as the Tachocline. Tachocline refers to the area you see right here in the illustration, and it's a kind of a transition area between the radiative zone and the convective zone where a lot of things mix in the star. This particular region is usually present in most stars that are more massive than about 0.3 masses of the Sun, but not in the smaller red dwarfs. And this particular layer is formed because these two zones have slightly different properties. 
the internal radiative zone sort of spins as a kind of a solid body. This is mostly due to the amount of pressure present inside the star. But the outer region moves more like a fluid, and because of this there is a kind of a friction or a kind of a shear created between these layers, which the scientists believe is also responsible for creating tremendously powerful magnetic fields in the Sun itself. And so Tycho Klein is very likely an extremely magnetically charged area with a lot of other extreme effects as well. And so in this case the scientists wanted to see is so what would happen if a hypothetical chameleon particle passed through this particular region and interacted with the extremely powerful magnetic fields present in the Tycho Klein of our Sun. And it looks like according to the scientists mathematically it's definitely possible. It looks like if a dark energy particle was present in this highly magnetic area and then essentially interacted with the powerful magnetic field present in the Tycho Klein, it would sort of get coupled with the dark energy particle, with the chameleon particle, and would produce what the scientists refer to as the dark energy quanta, which would then travel toward planet Earth and would then interact with xenon, producing the observations with the exact properties detected in the xenon 1T experiment. Or in other words, they believe that the dark energy particles inside the Sun very likely were responsible for the 53 extra detections that we've discussed last year. Now this by itself right now is a really exciting study and also a really exciting proposition. Mostly because it suggests that we can use these unusual xenon based detectors to not just look for potential dark matter, but to also look for dark energy, or at least one particle possibly responsible for the effects of dark energy. Although that's of course assuming that those original detections from 2016 to 2018 were not a fluke. For all we know, it could still be explained using something entirely different, possibly even some sort of interaction we never really considered. So for now we don't really know what exactly was discovered, but as of today, the mathematical model explaining dark energy as opposed to the axions that represent dark matter seems to make a little bit more sense. And that's why this is probably going to be a study we're going to come back to and talk about more in some of the future videos. And that's mostly because from all of the experiments in the past and from all of the different discoveries, we've never really gotten that close to potentially discovering the origin of dark energy. And so for now that's sort of all we know. There's a slight chance we might have found dark energy, but we're not going to know for sure for possibly a few more years. On that note, check out all of the relevant links in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.